Any more discussion around uh, H237, the saliva bill, as we've been calling it? Um, and then we're probably going to come to a vote. Uh, so um, this would be the time to ask any last questions or bring any thoughts forward that you haven't already. Oh, there's one. Any yeah. <laughs> See it, <I'm> <laughs> as, long as, as long as it's not tweaked, I have his vote. All right. Good luck. With the, yeah. Uh, your ear. So, when I'm just saying we're, we're sort of doing final committee discussion around the saliva bill before um, we come to a vote. And, uh, That's just here. I think other, others, others will be here to vote later, so we're going to hold the vote open for them. But, um, so, any, anybody have any? Discussion about this? They want to. for No. I. I. Go ahead. No. No. Go ahead. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say I, I appreciate the chance that we did uh, dive actually. You know, honestly, deeper into this bill than I thought that we even would, and it was it was good to get a perspective and, and, and quite honestly, being one that even as a public defender and one that you know had great calls about, you know, having this into the, the arsenal, so to speak. From a defense perspective, I actually think this bill actually helps instead of hurts um, um, protections for for folks. A couple, a couple reasons why. One, obviously with the preliminary test, by making clear that that's, you know, that's not um, evidentiary, um, can be used against someone for, for, not, for not using it. Um, but, but more significantly, is actually when then even if you then get the probable cause and bring someone back to the barracks and do the evidentiary saliva, um, because of one at least what we heard from all sides is that is actually good evidence and, and you know the the work that's that's been in the lab is is, is is stronger. But more significantly because of that, I think it actually provides greater safeguards for those. And again, because right now as it stands, in order to fight, get convictions, I mean, we are having to utilize the DRE. And the reality is the DRE is only as good as the DRE. If you look at, you know, their, their various, um, because, you know, each one's DRE has to do so, so many tests per year, and, and they look at, you know, like accuracy and accuracy. And I remember the last, the last report I saw in the fall, I mean, they range from our DREs from like 70% accurate to like a 98, 100% accurate. But the, but the point of the matter is, you know, right now we're relying on this DRE that might get it wrong. You know, I mean, I'm not saying they would, but they could. And as we even heard from Tom Anderson, as we heard from Tom Anderson, you know, if we went to the lab and it came back, I know that person was negative. I mean, it's very hard to see if they would actually proceed with that case then because Right now, you know that, and, and they, we also learned that they keep that that evidence for long enough so that way the defense could use it if need be. And so, in all those reasons, and, and also because I think it will be highly litigated, and, and I also trust our attorneys to, to make sure that if it's bad evidence, it's going to stay out. That that I do support this bill. So sorry. Yeah, no, I so Jansen, I'm glad you're concerned about the inaccuracies of DREs. I'd like to know what you're, why you're not concerned about the inaccuracies of saliva testing. Um, well, because on the, not on the on the initial one, but but the the at least what we were what we heard from others from those that testified on both sides of the equation, there wasn't any testimony with respect to the evidentiary test. You know, that goes to the lab and is tested. That you know that. You know, the, those those parts are, are more accurate. And so my point is, I I believe that right now that at least provides, uh, honestly, evidence that could even be exculpatory evidence now for, for defendants that otherwise wouldn't have that opportunity under our current scheme with, of, of really having to rely solely on the, the um, a DRE. So my understanding from all of the testimony that we heard mm -hmm is both tests only are accurate at detecting presence of drugs. Not, the second one, yes, deals with levels, but if you look at the research, it will say that they can't find any correlation between those levels, mm -hmm. at least for THC, and the drug itself. 
which is one reason that, again, I feel strongly that we shouldn't put an unreliable drug um, into the, that we can't test into the mix because of exactly the concerns that you raise of using unreliable DRE stuff. In fact, I, I would say that DREs have a higher um, accuracy rate than either of the two saliva tests. And I hope you guys have looked at some of the research related to the tests. Again, I'm happy to share NHTSA, the highways, but these are not like crazy liberal organizations. So, Margaret, can I just make sure I understand? Are you saying that the, that the, the research there is saying there's not a there's not a proven correlation between a certain amount of a drug and impairment? Is that the? Right. Yeah. In fact, in both ways. <clears throat> so one concern we have are people eating marijuana and um, clinical chemistry in 2014 talks about um, the, the extensive storage and prolonged release of, of how this drug stays in people's plasma and blood so that basically um, we can't, okay, here, let's see. Let me, I can let me come back with a quote about this. But, but basically, we can't tell um, at all either if people are impaired or not based on their level. A lot of it depends on a variety of different factors. And so the fact that we don't have any, um, NHTSA does not determine it accurate enough at this point to make recommendations. We're messing with people's liberty, and I think it's wrong. And I, um, I cannot, I cannot support this bill. I will try to add amendments to lessen the harm, but, but it's not something to be taken lightly. With science that we wish were further along than it is, it's, it's, it's unconscionable to me. But I, so, I, I think I've. Well, as I've heard you um, talk about what are your objections, and I, 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 well, I, I keep hearing that your concern is, and help me out if I'm wrong here, but that the that the tests are not indicating impairment, and I think I think that's absolutely true, and 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 that's the way we want it to be in this law. We're Unlike Colorado and maybe other states, where they have set a per se limit for THC to say if you have 15 nanograms or whatever it is, you're determined just like we do with alcohol to be impaired. <coughs> I, I don't think that makes sense, and I think that NHTSA study um, is really largely speaking about that specifically. Um, so, if it's the one I'm thinking of. So and, and we're, we're trying to say that connecting the fact that there is a drug in your system is an important, could be an important piece of evidence in, in determining whether someone is impaired by a substance, because that's what we have to prove in this state, that you're impaired by alcohol or drugs or a combination of those things. And that this is, we're trying to provide a way for law enforcement to have that, another piece of the evidence in, in making that proof. So Chip, I understand that the, tr the Transportation Committee, maybe I'm wrong, heard from Dr. Marilyn Hustis, mm -hmm. the former head of the Chemistry and Drug Metabolism section of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And she said on NPR in 2016, I have not heard her testimony, marijuana isn't like the height of, it, of your intoxication at the moment when your blood THC levels peak. And the high doesn't rise and fall uniformly based on how much THC leaves and enters your bodily fluids. It's proven you can still measure THC in the brain even though it's no longer measurable in the blood. Hustis found that THC rapidly clears out of the blood of occasional users within a couple of hours. You could have smoked a good amount, just waited two hours, still be pretty intoxicated, and yet pass the drug test for driving. If you eat the weed, your blood never carries that much THC but daily users are different. <laughs> Heavy smokers build up so much THC in their body fat that it could continue leaching out for weeks after it was last smoked. Chronic frequent users will also have a constant moderate level of blood THC even when they are not high. So, 
Um, I had heard, uh, not in that detail, but I heard that before, so I a couple of responses. One, if you're, if you're driving and you are impaired because <coughs> of THC in your blood, then under our laws you can be prosecuted for driving impaired. If you're driving with THC in your blood but your driving is not impaired, it doesn't matter when you took it or when you smoked it or whatever. The other thing is that we heard Dr. Conti say um, that the levels, the rate at which it comes back into your blood from being stored in your fat are at a low enough level that it won't trigger the a positive on the roadside test. Those are set at a, at a number that would not be triggered by that kind of reaching back into your system. So, so again, the first test is not admissible, but it kind of can draw you in to get more. The evidentiary one we would be making um, up for being considered. And I would love to make sure and hear that it's not prejudicial because I'm not convinced that um, it doesn't impact juries to get that information that may or may not be relevant. If somebody is on um, taking their medicine for a medical condition and even in conversations, people keep asking about how accurate is it, not about impairment. And so throwing different drugs that people may or may not have in their saliva is, I'm worried it's prejudicial. So I, I mean, I, to me, I, of the, your concerns, I think that one, for personally, just for me, rings the most true. I, you know, my reading of, of the cases that that I've been able to look at and and um, thinking about it, I, I, it seems to me that it, it is a piece of evidence that can be useful in helping the court or a jury determine that. But but the court is. And no one else but the court can say this piece, we believe that this kind of evidence is more prejudicial than it is probative or not. Or not. And, but, but we won't, I mean, we have to you know, vote based on our thinking about that here, but we won't know how the courts are going to find that until it goes to court. So why not wait and see how, you know, we're going to see a lot more evidence coming out of other states that are doing it. And just like people here have been nervous about trying new things to see what the impact is, why not wait? It's not cheap. It is not cheap. And frankly, besides the dollar amount, it comes at a cost of possibly having innocent people um, have more tangles with the law than makes sense. So I don't know other people. You know, I, I would say there, for me, there are a couple arguments about why we wouldn't wait. And one is um, that those, you know, as those cases go through in other states, we'll know how Michigan might feel about it, but we won't know how the Vermont Supreme Court will react to it, partly because we have a more stringent uh, search and seizure law in our Constitution than, uh, right, in our Constitution than, than the U.S. Constitution. Um, but the other thing is, you know, again, for me, if I think there's a way to um, provide uh, better enforcement of impaired driving through the use of a, of a statutory, um, you know, a new statute, a new test, a saliva test, um, that also seems to me to meet the legal channel or hurdles that it needs to, to cross, then I, I would say, why would I want to wait and not start, you know, have a way to enforce those those laws and protect Vermonters, possibly protect Vermonters from impaired driving now? So what it sounded like was we are arresting people now for impaired driving, and frankly, the um, buzz that this is connected somehow to um, tax and regulate for marijuana. If you look at which drugs are the most dangerous on the road, marijuana alone is not even necessarily, um, put it this way, if it were 
if I felt like we were putting more Vermonters at risk for safety versus we were putting more Vermonters at risk for losing their liberty, that would be different. But it does sound like, again, from um, <coughs> to see. When I looked at the dangers of the risk of driving, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, May 2015. Um, adverse effects, um, okay, first of all, crash risk associated with specific amounts of marijuana unknown. Um, federal study found that unlike alcohol, drivers under the influence of marijuana tend to compensate for their impairment. They retain insight into performance and compensate where they can, like slowing down. The study done in the state of Washington, their Traffic Safety Commission in 2016, driver toxicology testing report, says second to alcohol, marijuana has persisted as the dominant drug involved in fatal crashes for over a decade. It goes on to say, while this report explains that trend and the characteristics of these drivers, this information is not sufficient to determine if marijuana directly contributed to the causes of these crashes. There was another one from the highway safety folks that says when you compensate for other factors, they can't necessarily make the connection. So again, we're taking away something from people. Vermont Supreme Court is, you're right, they're very protective. They don't allow lie detector tests. And I'm not sure why we think this is <clears throat> going to help anyone. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll defer. Uh, I, I, I'll, if I can, I'll take my part, but I think I don't want you to lose whatever thought you just had, Thank so you. I'll defer to you. Yeah. Rachel, um, you know, I've heard you for the last week or so talk about lie detector tests as some sort of quality thing here. I believe that lie detector tests are not admissible in court because of the high operator error in them. It has nothing to do with you know, is it good or bad or indifferent? There's just so much variance because it's the operator of that of that polygraph machine that ultimately makes a determination if that person's telling the truth or not. Well, that's apples and oranges as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I do want to address a couple of the concerns that Barbara raised. Um, both respect to to the concerns of of if this now also is going to do. Um, Chill for individuals for getting the kind of proper treatment they need and, and use other drugs as prescribed, um, or even the, the reality that, that people that are use, are chronic users of marijuana would have more in their system or you know, just be at a higher level than others. Um, on, the, on, first, on the first point, we, we truly are in, a, you know, on the bridging in, the, in, in a, a, a whole new world and and how we're going to deal with issues of of, of, of drug use, and even if we legal if, you know, we legalize drugs, and then the balance of that is still safety. These are honestly the discussions we we've, we've had, and it took years and years to get there. What we had with with alcohol, and again, just as it's you're completely if you're completely allowed to use it, do what you want with it, but ultimately still there is that safety component that that you can use something even legal, as long as it doesn't impair one's driving. And then going back to then that too, then that's the reason why, you know, when when I've when I've watched videos of, you know, of 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 cases where someone was 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 taken in for, for impaired driving by drug, I mean, officers will ask, you know, at roadside that are you on any prescription any drugs? Again, that's not the and, and again, it's the reality is there still could be things that they're taking even prescribe things that can impair one's driving. And so just because you're prescribed something, it doesn't give you then that, that additional Plus. protection to Plus. then be able, if it then does impact your, your driving. And so, and so on, on those things, and again, I think, because I, as, as I mean, it's to me well aware, I have, I have no problem with the, with the legalization of this drug and, and probably probably some other drugs too, but at this, then you have to counterbalance, you know, the safety side. It's like legal is one thing, but if it's actually comparing one's the other. And then going back to, again, going why the science is still evolving and developed, however, and, and I think 
uh, you might be able to help me with this one, Gary. The thing is, chronic alcohol users are the same. I mean, are the same. You know that you'll have chronic alcohol users that that of course I know we don't have you know a number, but the point is they're stable at above the legal limit. I mean that's that's their normal. Yet still through development of case law stuff, we've realized despite that, that's still a risk to have those individuals on the road. So you'll still have people that even though that's their normal, will still get convicted of a DUI. And again, that's, I mean, but again, but it, it took us a, a way, way to get there. And again, that, and I think anyone in that process said, well, then we're going to just get rid of the alcohol. But I do think that, and again, maybe I do trust our courts more than maybe I should, but I trust that this, all this will get litigated and it'll work out. But I don't think doing nothing and potentially putting a greater risk on our road is, is worth it. And so that's why. I, I, I will support this bill. So, uh, um, I just wanted to say, uh, we're just having a kind of a final discussion on clearly that so I have a bill um, before we vote this afternoon. So I'm going to ask Barbara if she wants to respond to and see if you have any discussion you want to bring to us on, on this topic. Barbara, did you want to respond? To I have no disagreement with anyone about people driving that are impaired. I don't want people driving that are impaired. I don't want to, though, use wishful, scientifically weak tests to feel good about, oh, we did something. Because, frankly, I'm not convinced the roads will be safer. Um, and we know that, again, people who may very well end up being innocent, can end up having an invasive search, a violation of medical privacy, <clears throat> an unnecessary arrest, a tow fee for their car, you know how I feel about towing, um, potentially a night in jail, while this is all going on. It's not, it's not nothing. It's not just, just, it's big, it's big stakes. And again, I do not want to be part of a, allowing something that the science isn't there to um, to hurt Vermonters in that way. I think that we can add more DREs cheaper and you know accomplish the same task in a better way. I just have a clarifying question, and I apologize for coming in so late today, but. Um, so are we voting on 2.1 or do we have an amended version? So we have the amended version. It's funny. We have 1.1 as the amended version. 2.1 was the one that came out of transportation. Yeah. So ours is 1.1, uh, 2.26. Do you have a copy of Oh, the, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't see it posted to our committee page, and I have a copy of it, so I don't know what we're doing. Here, why don't I give you this? Uh, I'm sure my Is my cabin over there? Thanks. Uh, around. Here, you catch the whole department. Here we go. Oops, sorry. Is that it? I have notes on that one, but if you want a clean copy, you can do it. Yeah, I just give him a clean copy if you want a clean copy. Uh, Martin. <coughs> so, I, I mean, I wasn't going to say anything more, but the, the concept that because of a test that identifies that there may be a drug uh, on board, so to speak, that that's going to lead to there being innocent people arrested and going through all this, I, I absolutely disagree with because the first question still is, what is the evidence of impairment? And, and that needs to be established uh, uh, for reasonable suspicion with, this, uh, with uh, specific and articulable facts to show that the person uh, is, is impaired by something. Uh, and, and this, yeah, this allows some connection to, you know, all right, there's an inference that would be involved after an evidentiary test that identifies the existence of the substance. But that has to be tied with all the other factors that has to be there for probable cause to arrest uh, and uh, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt uh, to be prosecuted on these. So I think there's plenty of uh, protections 
in the system uh, to keep this tool from being something that in and of itself is going to be leading to innocent people uh, being arrested or jailed. So, Can I, After we met this morning, um, somebody reminded me that recently, and I was just looking up the year that happened, I think it was last year, there was a lawsuit in the city of Burlington um, because um, the officer thought he smelled marijuana, which again would probably be enough for the um, low bar that we're setting for having reasonable suspicion. Turned out there was no marijuana and um, the city of Burlington had to pay out a $85,000 um, damage claim or something. I have not verified that amount. Um, the officer was fired. And the Supreme Court's relying to smell alone. So. And, and if there wasn't marijuana, and this, this test could have shown that there was no marijuana in, in, that was on the person. So, I mean. So, let the so. defendant voluntarily agree to it. Well, the, the defendant. Uh, roadside can, had, can decline to have that test. If, if there's enough other evidence <coughs> for the officer to arrest the person and, and take him into the barracks, at that point, uh, if, if he or she declines to take the evidentiary test, uh, that can be held against and that can be uh, evidence that they refuse to take the test, but not on the roadside. Roadside, they can say, no, thank you, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you my saliva or my breath. And if you're young so, and, and of color, it's pretty scary right now to, to say no to an officer. Um, I am aware of many young people in Burlington who feel like they are singled out for the kind of car they drive, or you know, whatever um, bumper stickers they have, like it, it's 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 going to hurt. It's going to hurt people that don't have the legal means to hire a good attorney to defend them. But I mean, this is not. It's it's talk about geographic justice. I I'm not happy. Yes. And I. We, I think we have at least representation of law enforcement in here, so maybe chime in, like if I'm wrong in this. And Gary, I know it's been a while since you've done stop, so my things are a little different, but I mean, between my years in the main city office and even though I was a comic attorney, I've literally watched hundreds of roadside stops for, 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 for deep, mainly alcohol, but a couple of them have been drug to related. And literally every single stop, every single stop I've ever watched is, you know, you. Everything happens, you know, at the at the door first. The interaction enough to see that I'm I'm a little concerned. Ask the person out of the car. You do the field sobriety test. At this time, they've got their PC, and but and then and then that is when they ask for the breath test, and and then it, it they they very well could refuse. Sometimes they do, but the point is, probable cause has already been established by the time we get to that question anyway. And I mean, I don't see this playing out any differently. That that people are going to use this as a way to get around the all the steps to get to the PC, and now just try to use this this little field sobriety swab as a way to bring people to the barracks. Again, I might be wrong, but I just I've never seen that happen before. So I, I don't. And please, if someone has seen that happen another way, please speak up because I I, I just haven't. Kind of like the uh, deputy commissioner of DPS was sitting there to <laughs> answer that question because my last 15 years in service, uh, the closest I came to a roadside stop was getting a paper cut at my desk. So. <laughs> Did you hear what I was saying? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is like high school. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> Distracted. I was listening. doing some research. Actually. <laughs> no, so so my, my question again, and this whole concept, uh, obviously, I I still very much have equated this process to how we get to a preliminary breath test as well. But again, in my own practice as a defense attorney, every video I've ever watched, you know, when I represented one of those clients, is you know you have the initial interaction at, at the door, then you know. There's enough then to ask them to get out of the car, go through the field sobriety test. At that point is when the officer has now reached probable cause. Yet, that's then when they ask for the breath sample. And obviously, 
as many people do, they can say no, but they've already established probable cause at that point. So they haven't even asked for that piece of evidence, so they've, got, they've done all the things to reach probable cause. I, I would assume this is the same way this is going to work, or is there the potential that, that, that this evidence will be used as a way to get the probable cause and not have to worry about working, working to that process? I don't feel I'm qualified to answer that question. Okay. I haven't been on the road in a long time. Mm -hmm. So okay. I can certainly dig around for an answer. I, for I it. appreciate it. Uh, that just brings up the fact that we have put in the bill that um, the test alone is certainly not, right. mm -hmm. doesn't establish a yeah. cause. Yeah. Um, Selena, did you have any? Yes, I had a, um, it's a really little detail question, but it was a question I had asked Trish Conti um, during her testimony last week about the, um, the methadone cutoff mm -hmm. levels and how that compared to a like, therapeutic dosage, but we didn't think we ever got an answer on that. I don't remember seeing any. Remind me mm -hmm. what specifically what the question is. So methadone is one of the substances yeah. that the roadside test detects, yeah. and um, I look at the notes. I think I can yeah. see what the cutoff dosage was, but somebody was going to get back to <coughs> that compared to just a therapeutic dose. Of so you know, I did a little research on it because that, I was concerned about it. Um, it's a minor question. It's actually not. I know Trish Conti is on vacation now. Right. Anyway, I'm going to try to get the answer to Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Yeah. That's what yeah. Trish Conti's, I think, secretary sent to us last yes. week. Yes. I think I missed that. Through Faith. Faith Brown. Okay, it says therapeutic levels for methadone are 300 to 1,000 NG ml for narcotic stabilization and 50 to 100 for pain. Blah, blah, blah. So now I have to go back and look and see how that relates to it. Is that, does that provide the answer? Okay. It says that I, you know, I have to provide the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the answer, but I have to find yeah. out where. It's like Jeopardy. Yeah. 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 Oh, Johnny, uh, 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 Johnny Carson. Because she told us what level. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my understanding with, with um, methadone treatment is um, that there is a period, there can be a period, uh, where there a person shouldn't be driving when they're even getting the, the therapeutic level of methadone. Uh, so again, again, it would be my feeling that if the person is driving impaired, and it, and it's because for whatever reason they have well, they have therapeutic methadone in their system, and that's what's causing the impairment, or if that's the only thing that's in the system that can be tied to impairment, you know, it shouldn't matter whether it's the therapeutic amount or not it's again were you driving impaired and there are times in, in my understanding uh, when when some, somebody is having the medicated assistant assisted treatment that their people are not supposed to drive and, and if they are driving at that point it, it should be held to to this particular violation so we did find the comparison number um, it detects for the two, depending on the roadside implement, it detects for 15 or 20 nanograms compared with a therapeutic level of 300 to 1,000 or 50 to 100. So we detect them. Yeah, so it's a much lower dosage that's detected. But I guess to Martin's point, presently, <laughs> setting aside a saliva test. If someone's driving is impaired and the and the officer pulls them over and you know continues to believe they have reason that they are impaired and the DRE is called or whatever, they they will be prosecuted now for impaired driving. And right. I'm not sure if the, the 
the um, addition of a saliva test changes that very much. I mean, it, it, it well, it does. It is that additional piece of evidence that now we know specifically what might have been causing the impairment, and and the fact the existence of methadone in someone's system could be, if it's the evidence your test can be brought up in court, but the case still revolves around proving the impairment. Right. No, I agree. Yeah. Okay. We might have talked ourselves out for, the, for now. You want? No, I'll have to. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just want to talk about the science of it. Um, it is a package. It's the art of the science, maybe. There is very clear measurements as to what's there and how much. Uh, but it's not the only thing. I think that Dr. Connie is very clear that the, um, the blood test or the saliva test from the lab is not an indication of impairment. It's a package of the whole thing. There are symptoms that they know you should show when they're part of the analysis based on what that blood test or that saliva test shows in the lab. You have a certain amount, you should show some kind of symptoms. This is no different than what they do in medicine. I mean, you know, when we go in and we've got a bunch of symptoms, they may not necessarily take a blood test, but they put together observations and combinations and decide what medicine you should get to fix it. It's, a, it's an art. It's an art with science. The science, they can give you lots of tests and they can sit down and tell you exactly what's in your blood and all the other stuff, but they don't necessarily have to. It's part of a package. This is a part of a package of observations and all of the things that go on at the roadside and with the DRE and with the officer through years of experience. They have the blood test or the, or the saliva test that can go to a lab and the lab measures what's actually there. I don't think there's anything wrong with the science. I mean, I'm not sure why it would be inaccurate. Um, according to Marilyn Eustace and Dr. Conti, they did do a pilot and the reliability of the test in the Vermont study, the preliminary accuracy is uh, greater than 90%, 93%, 95% specificity was greater than 96%, 99% for Jaeger. I mean, this is the specificity for the drug. So I, I don't see where the science is not reliable. It sounds like the pilot we did in Vermont, among other pilots, have been reliable. And um, you know, I'm willing to look at it as a package that will evolve over time, just as we did with the breathalyzer and with the alcohol stuff for the past 30, 40 years. It's maybe a first step, but I think that, I think that for the safety of the public, we're going to legalize this drug among other drugs, because it may not even be the most prevalent drug. We have an opiate crisis right now that is just rampant. And I think we have to go and really think of the public safety issues. Some people will get off. We will have some people who will actually not have a problem. It may be a validation of their, of their innocence. That's good. But I support it, and I think that it's a first step, and we can evolve with it over time. All right, I mean, I, it's clear your, your concerns are you have passionately, and, um, and I, I have to say I, that I, I think that's a good thing for us to have your concerns brought forth and, and to have you passionate about them because it, it forces me anyway to have to really think think this through. I, you know, obviously at the end of the day we're going to disagree about. Um, where we come out on this, but I, I, I do want to say I appreciate you bringing those to us. I, I'm likely to bring forward some amendments. I'm, right. I'm hoping that when this bill is presented on the floor, it, when we, when people ask the question of accuracy, it's answered that we're talking about accuracy of presence of drugs, not accuracy of people being. Um, not able to drive because I think people are very confused about that and we owe it to our colleagues to share with them the facts and not give them false illusion and I just feel like it's sort of 
not anyone's intention to do that, but we just need to make sure we're super clear. This does not show that somebody is um, uh, incapable of, of um, or incapacitate, I'm trying to think of the word I want, but um, it's, um, and perhaps I just live in a district and work with people who are so disenfranchised um, at times, like students, the young, that it's hard to see the glass half full. But until I feel better about how people in our state get treated through our criminal justice system, I do not want to give more very low level um, discretion to more people. Um, do you, are you able to tell us more about the nature of the amendments that you're Sure, yeah. Sharing? I was sharing them this morning. Um, so one suggestion I had was that we only put on the drugs that are illegal in Vermont so that there's no confusion about people who are on methadone or taking their ADHD medication, et cetera. So just cocaine, heroin, um, take THC off because one, marijuana is legal after July. And frankly, we know, I mean, again, I, I'm happy to share with folks the research on how inaccurate the THC testing is on either test. Um, and it's gonna hurt anyone if you constituents that are on medical marijuana, I, I would I suggest you talk to them because I've heard from some and they're not pleased about this. So that's one amendment. Another amendment is to wait until there is a um, test that has been approved by NHTSA mm -hmm. and then implement it. Um, and then, yeah, I rattled up a few this morning. So I don't know which ones, I mean, I was trying to get them built into the bill, but it was not successful. Um, so I need to think about which ones I feel like will do some damage control from what my worries are. So those would all come as floor? Amendments. They'd come here, for, I guess so. I mean, I, I tried this morning. I'm not sure I'm able to get any um, support in here. It didn't sound like it. But it's, it's just something that I, I, again, I can't look at myself if I don't fight this out all the way because I feel so strongly about the issues here. And I'm sorry we all don't agree, and I just want people to know it's you know, not, you know, it's not the way to go against a committee on the floor, but it, this crosses a line for me that I can't be quiet about it. Oh, uh, yeah, the actual um, language says it's regulated drugs. That includes some prescription mm -hmm. drugs that are so that's a little, little different from her. Yeah. Right, because I again. Um, yeah, I just want to like would definitely have to say drugs that are legal. In Vermont. Well, you can be taking Vicodin for pain and really don't belong behind the wheel. But I'm not arguing drugs. with. I'm not yeah, arguing. I'm not with arguing people. either. But that's yeah. what the language says, and I think that covers but, those seven drugs that we talked about, including the methadone. But the language wouldn't give you a free pass on that. Like I would get the amendment written away that it's more like I'm concerned about people that are on buprenorphine or methadone or suboxone, people that need to take their ADHD medicines. There are probably a bunch of other ones too that do not impair driving that the underlying condition is gonna be a lot worse if somebody doesn't do it. People need their cars to get to work. We're, we're you know, the, the person on medical marijuana that I most recently spoke to said, hey, I'd be better off getting off medical marijuana and going back on heavier drugs because those I know when they're out of my system and I don't wanna lose my license. And what am I supposed to say to those people? Yeah, sure, go back on opioids. That's the right answer. You know, so it feels like 
answers don't drive impaired. That's what the answer is. But I'm not arguing about that. So you can take your opioids at night and then drive the next day. You can't smoke your medical marijuana and then drive in the next week or legally drive and, and have so. any hope of not coming up positive on the but, but, test. But you have so to have been driving folks here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's been a good discussion. We've covered, yep. covered the ground. Um, unless someone has a new point of uh, discussion, I think, and, uh, and we will look forward to having um, some amendments from Barbara, and, and we'll be able to debate the specifics of the amendment when those are here in front of us. Um, but at this point, um, given that we're closing in on 2 o'clock, I think we're going to need to um, come to a vote on this. And here. I'd like to make the motion that uh, we uh, accept uh, H237 version 1.1. And I second. Okay. Colbert? Oh, God, I'm so in the fence. <laughs> Can we skip him and come back? Yes, give me a come back. That's fine. Dickinson? Yes. Jessup? Yes. Lalonde? Yes. Morris? Rachelson? No. Viennes? Yes. Will Hoyt? Yes. Burdett? Conquest? Yes. Grad? Coburn? <laughs> Did we hear that Kaya was coming back today? I have, I have not heard that. I thought Maxine said that most likely not. Okay. So. Yeah. so uh, we, we, I got it. Yeah. Which was no. Um, can I go on the record and say something? I'm sorry, Maxine isn't here, but my views have nothing to do with me being on the board of the ACLU, other than the fact that the last time we took up saliva, the ACLU was pleased with my with my concerns matching up with theirs, and so. This is not me speaking as a ACLU board member, and I just want that clear. <laughs> I'm still trying to digest this whole new version. No, it's yeah. unfair to you to put you on the spot. Yeah, we need well, more time. Um, can't hear you know, we, I can, so we can hold the vote open, open until, uh, until. Okay, we'll do you say. need me to do the like step up? No, no, no. I just won't turn it in yet. Just okay. let me know say, before we turn it in. I think that would be helpful. I'd just I like to. Yeah. Totally fine. Yeah, yeah I've, I've been really. I'm just working at the end of this. I would yeah. like to report the bill. I may. Uh, can't say that. I'm not sure who. Okay. Uh, who Okay. Well, I mean, but we'll have to have someone from our side, won't we? Well, we'll have somebody from the committee reporting yeah. our, our work on the bill, but um, the chair will decide who's going to do that. Okay. Reporting the bill on the I will let her know. You can let her know that you're interested. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're going to move on. Is Sonia Gibson? Cafeteria, you want me to get in? Uh, sure. Yeah, we're well. We're, early. we're a few minutes early, a couple minutes early, but our plan was to hear from her about 42. Yes. Sonia, why don't you come right up? <laughs> well, I can start somewhere, right? True. Have a seat. Um, so I understand you're here to talk to us about each four and two, and are you and you're here from out of state? I understand. Yes, I'm here from California. Yay. So um, uh, we'll ask you in a second to introduce yourself for the record and, and then tell us what you have to say, and then you can tell us why you're here from California. Great. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sonia Gibson. I'm from a company called Encore Capital Group that's based in San Diego, but we are a licensed uh, debt collector in the state as, as well as a debt purchaser. So Encore is um, first and foremost leading the industry of how debt collection should be done in the country as well as in Vermont. Uh, we purchase debt for primarily credit card accounts from all the major banks and retailers and credit card companies. We're the preferred debt buyer because of our standards of practice and our consumer bill of rights. 
um, there are a multitude of things we do differently than others in the space. Uh, first and foremost, we don't charge any interest and fees. So the debt that we purchase, we purchase from the banks and the balance will never go up for our consumers. We do not resell the debt, which means the consumer will only know their bank and then they will know us and no other company later on in time. We do not credit report on, on accounts where the consumer is making a payment, which is um, revolutionary, I think, in this space to say if someone's making an attempt to regain their financial footing and pay back their debt, uh, to not harm them through a negative credit report. We also have very lenient hardship policies, so someone who is going through uh, hardship of job loss, medical situation, their active duty military or their family members are, we do not collect from those consumers. Our discounts are on average about 40% off of the face value of the debt. And just last year in Vermont alone, we forgave $400,000 in debt to Vermont consumers through our discount program. Um, so that's our company as, in summary. Uh, I want to talk a little about our three concerns that uh, of this bill, um, 482, House Bill 482, that are relevant to this particular committee. And the first one is a, a topic of um, statute of limitations. And the way the bill is drafted, um, so statute of limitations in Vermont and, and the vast majority of every other state that I know of, uh, governs the timeline that you have to file a lawsuit. In Vermont right now, that timeline is six years for, for debt, consumer debt which means that after the six-year marker, as a creditor, as a debt collector, as a debt buyer, you cannot file a lawsuit on, on a consumer. What this bill seeks to do is it seeks to reduce that six-year to a four-year timeline, but that it expands the statute of limitation as a principle about litigation to be about all debt collection activities. The, the most important thing to know for, for Encore, and I think the industry as a whole, is that Litigation is the very, very last resort for, for Encore. Um, the vast majority, and I don't even know if I could say this publicly, but about 96% of our credit card outstanding obligations are resolved outside of the legal process. The consumer will never face a lawsuit. But there's going to be very unfortunate consequences that are, I think, unintentional by the advocates uh, if this were to pass. When you take an, a timeline to litigate and you apply it to all debt collection activity and, uh, and not allow debt collectors to contact their consumers after a four-year timeline and offer payment plans and, and make arrangements with the consumer, you're creating a timeline that at which after that point, the debt is going to be expunged. The debt will go away if a, cons if a creditor is not able to contact their consumer after four years. Additionally, reducing that timeline from six to four years, you're going to give creditors less time to work on a payment plan with their consumers. The reality of that situation is twofold. The first is access to credit. When collectors cannot contact consumers after four years, they're not going to be able to collect, and the immediate outcome of that is that they're going to be less likely to lend, and they're going to lend at higher interest rates, and study after study has shown that those that are impacted by this are going to be the low-income consumers. They're the ones who have the lower credit scores. Um, I have a myriad of studies that I'm happy to send to this committee, but everyone from um, the Harvard Kennedy uh, School of Government, uh, George Mason uh, University, Philly Reserve, New York Federal Reserve, they've all done study after study to show that restricting debt collection communication and activity with consumers has shown to have negative consequences for low-income consumers the most in, in their ability to gain credit and their ability to get uh, good interest rates. Can I stop you just there for a, sure. a couple of questions? So um, uh, the, your reference to um, four years as opposed to the, the standard or the <coughs> general statute of limitations, which is six, um, is that in the in the civil action section of this, section six? <coughs> section the reason I six, ask is because the um, copy I have says three years, and I'm just wondering, yes. is there a difference? So, as far as I know, uh, there has been an updated draft oh, I'm looking okay. at from yesterday, where it was originally three years, and I think the proponents have changed it to four years as of yesterday. Right. So, um, so, but we are talking about the same section. Okay. Correct. So my other question then is, um, so the, the action must come within four years now of the date that the, the reason for the action happened, right? 
So mm -hmm. if, if someone is making payments and you all are uh, working with them over that time, there would be no, you wouldn't have a, there, a reason for the act to bring the action. At some point, they, let's say, stop and you all want to um, pursue it through civil litigation. You know, two years from that time, or four years, or from whenever that happens. As far so, as I'm. So I'm just trying to understand how uh, this impinges on the things you can talk about your ability to work with the consumer, et cetera. Yeah, so as far as I know, that in Vermont, which is unique to other states, the, the timeline actually starts from the date of delinquency and not necessarily from the date of last payment like other states have. So um, to compare it to other states that the timeline starts tolling from the date of last payment is different. In Vermont, it is from the date of the default occurrence, essentially. Um, for us, and, and you're getting to the second point I have of concern, which is, look, normally, the vast majority of the time, we suggest a payment plan to our consumers. We, they say, OK, I can only do $10 a month. We don't charge any interest to them, so it doesn't hurt them to say to make $10 payments for a longer period of time. If this artificial timeline of four years is put in place for all creditors, the first thing they're going to do is, is basically figure out how to collect before that timeline is up. And on cases and consumers where they otherwise wouldn't have litigated, they're now going to litigate sooner or you know, previously they wouldn't have litigated at all, and now they're going to seek litigation because they know that at the four-year mark, they have no repercussion on this debt. There's no obligation for the consumer to pay them back because they're not able to contact them and, and talk to them. So, so is the delinquency that defines somewhere that you all, so if they're making $10 payments, uh, I, I guess I'm wondering, is, is even, though, even though they're making those payments, are they defined by statute or something else that says they're still delinquent? Or is it your decision about whether or not they're delinquent, which in that case would go to the when the when the cause of the action uh, accrued? Um, my, my look of this, um, we were having discussions over this during the summer when this bill was being discussed in a working group. Um, when we looked at Vermont, it's, it's defined to be the, the first occurrence of delinquency. <coughs> Now, I'd be very happy to say if you were wanting to change it to be about the last delinquency being the last payment, um, that would be certain, that would certainly make it an impact about the three-year timeline being from the last delinquency, not the first. This is, I mean, the, the sort of policy stuff is not in our committee. Yeah. I would wonder why you all, the person holding the debt, couldn't decide when they were delinquent, and therefore, you could say, now they've stopped making those $10 payments, they, they are delinquent, and from here on, we have four years to make the... Delinquency but, is defined so in, I, I in the... It is. It is, is and, and yeah. on two levels, so this, the state defines when we start the clock, yeah. but on a federal level, um, it's considered a point of charge-off, so the banks, uh, the after 180 yeah, days of non-payment, which is about six that. months, yeah. they charge yeah, off. Yeah, yeah I, I do, uh, and I might have missed this somewhere along the way, but... Uh, you know, you talked about the the issues of uh, of this uh, bill reducing it to four years, mm -hmm. and if I, if I if I heard you correctly, so right now at the six year mark, if people are still in your debt, you know they they've got a balance. They started out with a thousand dollars, let's say, just mm -hmm. for sake of argument. Six years later, they still owe you three hundred dollars. At that point. It, it can be charged off, but but my point, my, my, my thought is, at the six year mark, do you folks move in and take more aggressive action? Whereas, if it's reduced to four years, will you step in at the four year mark and take more aggressive action to, to get these debts cleared up? I think that's, I think unfortunately that's going to be the consequences of this legislation, is that creditors knowing, yes, when you know that the timeline to file a lawsuit is coming up, you're going to be more incentivized, unfortunately, to file a lawsuit at that point in time before it expires. Because after you have the, your timeline to file a lawsuit expires, you, you only have the ability to collect outside of a lawsuit. And in this case, the bill is doing both. It's shortening that timeline to litigate, plus it's saying you can't collect it by any other means. So I, I really see the, the <coughs> outcome to be that creditors are going to rush to litigation. They're going to flood the courts with more cases against consumers. And, and 
people who otherwise would not have been litigated upon. Maybe they, in year two, decided to do a four-year payment plan. Those type of consumers may not be even offered that payment plan anymore because of the change of, the, of this bill. So okay. that's something that you um, gave this testimony and, and whatever other testimony you're going to give us today um, in that Congress committee? Tomorrow. Oh, I'm, I, yes, I'm a, um, okay. a follow-up testimony okay. tomorrow. Yes. But I, right. but so we, I want um, to give you time. We have to be done at 2.30, so I want to make sure you have time to tell us the other areas of concern. Yes, so, um, so the first one being the expungement of debt after four years, second being the reduction uh, from six to four years. And then I think our third one, um, there's a component in the bill that discusses private right of action that consumers have for violations of the, of the act. And I, you know, we don't have a problem with the private right of action component, but I w our suggestion is to change that to be a per, per action and not per violation. The way uh, the legislation is phrased right now, uh, say I am a creditor who's used the wrong font, and it's been found that the font I used is deceptive to a consumer, which, trust me, there's every, I, I know it's a little funny, but it actually exists, and, and there's class actions that happen on these type of nuances. And so um, if I'm a creditor and I've sent out hundreds of thousands of letters with that font, now I'm going to be held liable for each of those letters that had the wrong font size. So I would ask that it be changed to be per action and not per violation so that this isn't a, an ability for someone to have a payday from litigation of class action cases. So where is that specifically? Um, this is on, and I, I'm working off of the latest version, um, but it's at the top of page 5 of 18. Um, uh, sorry, 2461B uh, sub 2. Would you read the, what were you having? Uh, sure. Um, you know what, I do have the civil penalty under section 4. On our old version, it's page 4, um, line 4, I believe. Two four six. Um, yes, I think you're on the bottom of page four in the old version. Correct. You read us the language. Um, it says five thousand dollars, five hundred dollars for the first violation, or one thousand dollars for each subsequent violation, up to five thousand um, dollars. So I, I, I would recommend to change the violation to be action on both the times it appears, or to really clearly specify that that's a cap maximum of 5,000. I think the way it reads now could be interpreted that it's each subsequent violation will get $5,000. So we just want to make sure it's capped at 5,000 or that the violation is changed to action. Either of those are, are options for us. So our, our version uh, just says $500 for a first or $1,000 for each subsequent. So it sounds like there's additional language already, um, but it's the, it's the just to clarify, word violation that you're concerned about, and not yes, or to turn that five thousand to be a cap, a maximum of five thousand for for a violation. Where does it say cap for violation? It does not, and so that's what we are recommending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you explain again <coughs> the difference between for action and for violation? Is I'm not sure I understand. Sure. So, um, uh, so say the in, in this case the font that we used was incorrect, and um, we we want to make sure that the penalty is for the act of for the action of using the wrong font. The, if it's per violation, it could be that every single letter we sent with that wrong font now is allowing the one thousand uh, um, dollar penalty to be to be issued. Did I hear you say, at, so at the end of a process, whether it's a four year or six year, at the end you're going to be writing off what remains, or something to that effect in layperson language? Is, is, um, did I hear no, not, like not actually. Um, so the charge off happens, charge. charge off is one finite point in time before, charge off happens before an account is delinquent and goes into collection. So uh, if an account doesn't pay for 180 days, 
charge off is one finite point in time that it becomes delinquent. It's written off by the banks, considered a loss by the banks, at which point either it goes to debt collections or to a debt buyer. Um, as a debt buyer or a debt collector, uh, when you get to, in, under current law, when you get to the six year mark, what that tells me is that I'm no longer allowed to file a lawsuit on that account, but that account is still a collectible account. It's a debt that's been granted. You still have the ability to collect on that debt. The debt doesn't just go away when the statute of limitations expires. The way this bill is phrased, though, is that now you're taking the six and making it four years, and not only can I no longer file a lawsuit, but, that, but now you're carrying over that timeline, and now I can't even contact the consumer even outside of the litigation process. <clears throat> and so from the consumer point of view, the advantage would be that um, if, if they don't have this additional two years from their point of view would be harassment, and from your point of view would be opportunity to collect. Is that, cr I'm, forgive my crude language, but I'm just trying to wrap up. Yeah, no, I think, I think what the proponents would say is that giving those two years back to the consumer means that they're no longer collected for old debt, what what I would counter that with is the reality is that now creditors are going to go to a lawsuit much sooner and not let it get to a point of, of year five or year six. They're going to hurry up and litigate so that they, they don't lose the ability to collect. Right. So that choice to litigate could happen at prior to the four year, prior to the six year, but isn't necessarily changing the calculus of the decision to litigate, but rather the time frame. I think that it does change. For, for a creditor, it does change because um, the, you're drawing a line in the sand that at, after four years, you have no other remedy on a debt. The debt will essentially go away because you can't contact the consumer. But that same line would be drawn at six years. No, because under current law, um, my line is only drawn for litigation, but not for collections through a phone call or a, a payment plan option. Okay. And that's the big distinction, yeah. Okay. And we have a couple other questions over here. I, I would say that those are really um, policy questions about when we're going to be, um, when a, a, a group such as yours might be allowed to bring an action um, and whether we should shorten that time. The questions around um, whether it should be per violation or per oh, action, I think. Okay. Are, no, no, it's okay. I'm just yeah. saying, you know, we're going to make Got sure it. we're. Well, I don't want to give you the false impression, too, that we'll be weighing in probably on, on those questions. I think down the hall they're going to um, be making those decisions for us. It'll be really very narrowly focused on any uh, legal questions here. I think, for, I think it's important for this committee to know that the intention is to reduce litigation, but I actually see this as, as flooding the courts with more litigation. That will be the real... And I, I, I hate to say it, but I've talked to a law firm in New England who <coughs> said, this is great. This will mean I'll, I'll get more <coughs> cases to litigate on, and I'll have to hire more attorneys, and it's growth for my business. And I don't think that's the outcome we want to see for consumers. Litigation is not a fun process for anyone. It's expensive for creditors. Consumer does not have a good outcome from it. Um, we don't want to see that happen. Well, we're not going to weigh in on that policy, I don't think. I, I think our committee would agree that we do not want to see more cases going into court for having trouble keeping up with the ones they have to carry. Just a quick follow-up, I guess. Um, what percentage of people stop paying on their debt at that six-year mark? I, I don't know exactly at the six-year mark. I know that uh, federally, the credit reporting timeline is seven years, which means you could potentially have a situation where a creditor would credit report an account but not be able to call or collect from the consumer. So um, as a whole, um, for our company, the, over the entire course of time, of, of everything that we purchase, 80% of people never pay a single cent. Wow. I'm shocked. Thank you. And, and, uh, any other questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck down the hall. Thank you. So we are about to walk through S-221, um, past the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's true we don't have it yet. However, I do think, you know, they're 
certainly is a sense of urgency that that I know a number of us are hearing from our constituents. I know the, the governor has, um, in his memo, has asked that this be passed, um, certainly considered as soon as possible. And um, it's not unusual for us, I think, with the immigration bill. Um, we have looked at bills before we've actually had, and I think we did that with the immigration bill last year. We've also, in the past, we've taken um, joint testimony with Senate Judiciary or other committees um, in anticipation of a bill coming coming forward, and I just thought it would be would be helpful um, for us to start giving us, you know, giving this bill um, attention because it's, um, it's it's an important issue. Eric, what version are we supposed to be looking at? Uh, you should be on version 2.1 uh, of the Senate Judiciary Strike Off, stated to February 23rd. Last Friday at 11 10 a.m. Yep. Is that the one? Yep. Everybody have the correct one? Get a hard copy of that, please. <coughs> Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. I feel like uh, it's probably been only a week or so since I've been here, but it feels like a month or two in my mind. But so, uh, busy, right? Right. Yeah, that's probably why. Good point. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick of the Legislative Council here to walk the committee through uh, S-221, an act relating to establishing extreme risk protection orders as it was voted out of the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, last Friday the 23rd. As you mentioned, Representative Grad, it's uh, due to come up on the Senate floor tomorrow, so still to be debated over there. Uh, that's also relevant to what I say here because you know it's always possible that amendments could be made on the floor sure. and I can certainly follow up with the committee and let you know if something I testified to today turns out to be incomplete or inaccurate because of some amendments <coughs> that are made so I'll make sure and loop you in on what happened although I'm sure you'll hear it anyway but <laughs> in, case, in case you don't I'll let you know. Okay but I think you'll also be talking about what other states have done and that, that where, yeah. where these bills come from. Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, I think that background is really helpful for yeah. us to, to understand. So. Yeah, that's exactly how I was going to start, so Great. thanks yeah. for that segue. <laughs> yeah, so, so a minute or two of background, S221, as you can tell by uh, the title, is uh, an extreme risk protection order bill, sometimes called an ERPO, E-R-P-O. Uh, some other states refer to them as GVROs, gun violence restraining orders. Uh, I think because of obviously the sort of tragic events that have happened recently in Florida and, and narrowly averted in Vermont, they've, they've gotten a lot more media attention lately and sometimes in the media they've recently been referred to as red flag bills. So it's sort of these different names that have, that have been uh, bouncing around for them. But they all sort of describe the same general thing, which is a, a court-created process uh, by which either a law enforcement officer or uh, a prosecutor or in some other states' uh, cases, a family member, household member, can go into a court and file a petition and get an order for a person's firearms to be removed and for uh, them to be prohibited from possessing firearms for a given period of time. Depends, obviously, on, on what state, what that period of time is. Uh, you'll see in this particular bill, it's the sort of, in one sense, it's a, a, up to a 14-day period, and the final order is up to 60. Uh, but those can vary from state to state. But, but um, it's interesting that, that you know, the bill was introduced in the Senate uh, in December, so long before any of the recent events had happened. But the event, I mean, the, the subject had obviously been percolating uh, around the legislature before then. And it's based on, as I say, there's a few other states. It's it's a handful only at this point. But uh, the, the two state statutes that have been around the longest are Indiana and Connecticut. They only allow law enforcement officers to file the petition. Uh, there's also much more recently enacted statutes in California, Oregon, and Washington. The California statute was initially uh, in response to a voter initiative. And they those three permit both law enforcement officers and household members to file the petition. Which three states are in? Yeah, California, Washington, and Oregon. And Whereas allow, Indiana yeah. and Connecticut are law enforcement only. And they allow, allow again, I'm sorry. Law enforcement officers and, and in some cases family members. Okay, okay. But, or household members. You know, it's sort of defined. Thank you. Yeah. 
So uh, it, it was, and the particular bill, 221, is, is, is based uh, uh, quite, quite strongly on uh, the uh, Oregon and Washington statutes, as well as some parts of the Connecticut one. The, the, one of the features you'll notice in 221 is that uh, only <coughs> state's attorneys and the attorney general can file the petition, which is the way that Indiana and Connecticut do it, whereas the other three, as I mentioned, are a little more broad. Uh, substantively based on those, but structurally, and sort of the way I organized it, it's in many ways also based on the current relief from abuse statute that we have in Vermont. So you remember there's, a, there's an RFA process that similarly allows someone to go into court and, um, and ex parte, which as we know in here means without notice to the defendant, right? You go into the court and appear before the judge, file an affidavit, no notice to the defendant, and can still obtain an order essentially that uh, protects the person who filed it, the petitioner, uh, from the defendant and can include all sorts of aspects. But um, that structure <coughs> is what I base the structure of this on. And so it may, some of the language, I have no doubt, will seem familiar to you as we look at it because you'll say, oh, isn't that in the RFA statute? And if you think that, the answer is probably yes because that's where I know a fair amount of it came from. Um, so that's kind of the background, the big picture of how it works. Um, the, uh, the kind of procedural structure of it is that uh, also similar to the RFA statute is that there's a way that you can go in and, as I just mentioned, uh, file this uh, file motion for an ERPO, an extreme risk protection order, ex parte, without notice to the defendant. And, um, and if the court grants that, or even if the court doesn't, there's also a procedure uh, for, by which you could file the petition to have uh, this order issued for a longer period of time. The, the ex parte one only lasts for a maximum of 14 days. Right? At the end of that 14-day period, uh, it expires, basically, uh, unless the prosecutor dismisses it. Um, but the, conceivably, the court could issue a permanent order at the end of that time that would then last for another 60 days. So this interesting thing, and, and I, I base this on the way the the RFA statute is, even though sort of you think about it chronologically in time, the, the ex parte order would ordinarily come first, right? But in the statute books, for whatever reason, the final order comes first, like you turn to that one and then, huh, and then you turn the next page and then the, and then the ex parte order is after that, yeah. which I copied in, in this bill in retrospect, you know, if I had to do it again, which maybe I will, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe that order, just, just in terms of logic, you know, because a lot of times that's what yeah. would happen first. Um, but that is the way the RFA statute was structured. I model on that. So that's sort of a long way of saying, uh, why don't we skip around in this bill a little bit rather than go right in order, because it just sort of makes more sense to read it that way. Um, and Eric, you mentioned yeah. 60 days. Yes. Um, okay. And um, the bill is introduced to Ohio. Was it a year One ago? year. Yep. Like our current RFA, like our current final. Yes, exactly. Yep. As introduced, it was uh, it was a one year period, and it was uh, amended to sixty days in committee. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Uh, so just a couple uh, on the a couple of points about the definitions before, and a couple preliminary before we get into it. You'll see that uh, we have a definition of firearms here, and I'm on. Oops, sorry. Can I get the mic? All right. I just have to imagine that it's up there. Sort of scrolling up there. <laughs> well, you guys all have copies anyway, right? Well, let me just say that first, that the, the definition of firearm is um, that's the same one. Remember what a couple of years back, we the legislature passed the, the essentially felons in possession statute, it's actually violent, people who commit violent crimes are prohibited from possessing firearms. That statute had a definition of firearms in it that references uh, a federal definition. That's the same one that's used in this bill. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, bill also doesn't apply solely to firearms, though it applies to explosives as well. And explosives uh, are also criminalized in Vermont law under Title 13, and the definition of explosives is just taken from what already exists uh, in the current explosives chapter. And then dangerous weapon, you'll see them on page 1, line 15, is defined to mean an explosive or a firearm. So I just say that because, as you know, there are many other statutes 
uh, that we deal with in here that use the term dangerous weapon, and it usually means something much more broad than it does here. When it's used in this context, it only means a firearm or an explosive. So, uh, good to bear that in mind. So, uh, another couple of uh, background points is that uh, having to do with jurisdiction and venue, so these proceedings, like RFAs, take place in the family division. Again, I think the intent with that is that there's some familiarity there with this type of process because of the family division's familiarity with not only RFAs, but uh, uh, the ex parte orders that are issued in mental health proceedings also happen in the family division. So, uh, and yeah. are those one year? Do, what, what's that? Those? those are actually, uh, I'll follow up on that with you, but the, uh, the initial ones are, are very short. I think they're 72 hours, uh, and then they have to, there has to be a, a, a follow up one. But I think they have to be renewed. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Let me follow up on the precise date okay. for that. Yeah. Okay, just a quick, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, just a quick uh, drafting question. So, uh, so the dangerous weapon um, definition, I, is that really necessary? I mean, could you, throughout this, wherever you have dangerous weapons, say explosive or firearm? And the reason I ask is, isn't this causing some potential ambiguity among our various statutes that have dangerous weapon. And it means one thing here, it means something else somewhere else. Uh, I'd say the answers to your questions are yes and no. <laughs> yes to the first one, we definitely have done it that way. I found that to be kind of uh, bulky. Um, but no, it's not uncommon for us to define one term differently in different places. So um, okay. uh, that, that was the... It's not that, not that it would be wrong to do it a different way, but that's right. sort of we're wondering what, what the thinking was behind it. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, sure. Yep. So just to be clear, that the emergency orders can be issued by any uh, division of uh, the any, court? Any, any judge in any division, right. Um, yeah. But is it, and permanent orders of this type could only be done in the family division? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, so there's a venue provision as well. You see that lines 13 to 15. So we are, we say, okay, they're in the family division. Uh, which, which family division, which county has to be either where the law enforcement agency is located, where the respondent resides, that's the person who's the subject of the petition, right, the one who owns the weapon or is in possession of it, or the county where the events giving rise to it occur. So any one of those three places is where the petition can be filed. So here's where I'm going to skip a little bit. So you see the first section here, 54053, is actually the final order. Right? That's the one that, that happens after, <coughs> typically you think it would have to happen after the uh, ex parte order. Although it is possible, it's certainly that someone, that, that a final order could be filed for, even though an, an, an emergency one had never been requested. So it's not necessary that it be done, uh, that there be a, an ex parte order in place for, for it to happen. But, you know, in all likelihood, I think they're thinking downstairs, like that these typically do happen in you know, emergency or crisis situations. So it, it would be oftentimes the case that there's, there's an emergency request filed. So let's get down to that. And that starts on page seven. So this is the, this is the ex parte emergency relief uh, provision right here. This allows, uh, authorizes the state's attorney or the office of the AG to file a motion requesting that the court issue an extreme risk protection order ex parte, everybody see that on line three, without notice to the respondent. Now, it, it provides a law enforcement officer with the ability to notify the court that this ex, ex parte order is being requested, but the court still can't issue the order until after the motion is filed. That's sort of envisioning there that you know, there may be a law enforcement officer on the scene who may want to let the court know that this is happening. And the reason for that is because the officer, him or herself, can't be the one who files the motion. It's got to be the SA or the AG, right? So the officer uh, presumably would be able to contact the SA or AG, whoever's going to file the motion, and uh, then it can be done. But uh, there's also an ability to let the court know that that's basically um, coming down the pike. So uh, there has to be a, an affidavit submitted. This is also similar to the RFA. There has to be an affidavit submitted with the motion, right? And the affidavit has to allege, this is on line nine, this is, this is crucial, has to allege that the respondent, that's the person in possession or control of the weapon, poses an imminent, it's a crucial word there, imminent, and I point it out because it's not in the final order, right? In the, and when you'll see when we get to the final order language, there's not an imminency requirement. I think that it makes sense because the imminency is what makes it uh, an extreme risk at that very sort of 
crisis moment, you know, the moment of the, you're asking the court to take an extraordinary step and issue this order without having given any notice or opportunity to be heard to the, to the respondent. Um, and part of the justification for doing that is the imminency of the harm if, uh, if the order is an issue. So uh, you have to allege that the respondent poses an imminent and extreme risk of causing harm to himself or herself or another person by purchasing, possessing, or receiving a dangerous weapon or having a dangerous weapon within the respondent's custody or control. Now, I read the language through right there. It appears many times in this bill, so I figured at least once we should look at you know, every word of it. We'll have to do that every single time. But, but that's sort of that's, that's repeated quite frequently. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the standard that we're operating with uh, on 221. So affidavit has to state um, specific facts supporting the allegations, including the imminent danger. So there has to be some specific facts in the affidavit that go to why this person poses an imminent danger. And uh, it also has to include any dangerous weapons that, that the person filing thinks that the respondent has. So, um, we, so that's what the, the affidavit has to, ship, has to show. That's what the uh, person filing has to assert. How does the court grant it? Uh, well, similar standard. Uh, the court shall grant the motion and issue the text temporary ex parte order. Again, uh, crucial language here on line 18, if it finds by a preponderance of the evidence. Everybody see that? So uh, also very important to think about that because preponderance is different from the standard that's in the final order. We'll get to, when you get to the final order, you'll see that it's clear and convincing. So there's a lower threshold uh, at the first stage of this proceeding. Preponderance, as you probably remember um, from other discussions that we ha we've had in here, is the standard used for in civil proceedings. Generally, means more likely than not. You know, uh, just the, the one, uh, just the, the slightest bit of evidence that uh, weighs in favor of one thing versus another. It's more like 51:49, and sometimes referred to as as well. 51%. In one direction, 49 percent in the other. Other could be a preponderance. And is that what um, some of the other states, like Connecticut, for instance? And Connecticut actually uses a a lower threshold at the at the uh, ex parte stage, a probable cause threshold, which is lower, and then uses the same clear and convincing one at the final order stage. But there are other states that that. Um, uh, I want to say uh, Oregon, Washington. I think there are a couple other states use preponderance at both. You know, at both the uh, <coughs> initial ex parte uh, stage of the proceedings <coughs> and at the final stage of the proceedings. There's a mix. Um, the can we, uh, somewhere can we get a visual or get a card or something? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, that's easily done. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so what was settled on here was preponderance. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, although uh, as introduced, it was clear and convincing. Uh, so that was another change that was made during the committee process. Um, so the court has to find by a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not, that at the time the order is requested, that's also crucial too, because it's the timing. It's happening right at that at that moment is when the the person has to be found to pose this harm. Uh, and they pose an imminent and extreme risk of causing harm to himself, et cetera, et cetera. I just said I wasn't going to read that language again, so I'm not going to. It's exactly the same as what I said earlier. Um, and then, uh, uh, on top of, top of page 8 now, the petitioner, that's who's ever filed for this motion, right, whether the state's attorney or the AG, they have to cause uh, a copy of it to be served on the respondent. So service is generally personal service <laughs> by the sheriff. Uh, so this ensures that the... Uh, that the person who owns or possesses the weapons gets notice of, of uh, the order. And also in that order, it's going to tell them uh, it's going to have a hearing date. This is also the way RFAs work. So when you get that initial order, which in this case uh, will result in the person's firearms being removed, right? So sort of think of how that occurs. The, the initial order is issued, uh, that's when the firearms get removed at the, in the first instance. And the order is served on the person. It's going to say, "You can appear in the court on here, appear in court on such and such a date, where there will be a hearing where you can contest this order." And the hearing has to be not more than 14 days after the after the service. So that goes to the initial point I made. Remember, this is only going to last 14 days at the most before they get into have an opportunity to get in court and argue that uh, you know they should get their their weapons back. So. Here's another important language right here, subdivision 2A. This is the, um, 
So remember, we just said, okay, that there's an extreme risk of harm that, that, uh, that has to be shown, right? That's the standard. Well, it sort of raises the question, right? Well, what does extreme risk of harm mean? So this language here is also going to be very familiar for the courts and for some practitioners because this is almost identical. I'll tell you, there's one little change that was made. But there was, this is otherwise identical to the uh, definition of danger uh, of harm to self or others that's in the mental health statute. So in the, in the statute for involuntary commitment, right, where a person can be, can be uh, uh, civilly committed uh, involuntarily on a petition from, uh, with some evidence from uh, medical evidence that they, on the basis of a mental illness, they can be involuntarily uh, hospitalized. So uh, the difference is that uh, this does not require a mental illness. You know what I mean? So then if you sort of think about it, the purpose behind this, that makes sense, because if you did require mental illness, then you wouldn't need this at all, because you already have that situation in place under the mental health commitment, right? You could commit somebody for that reason. Um, so this does not require that, but it, uh, otherwise, uh, subdivision Roman numerals one through three, see that the extreme risk of harm to others may be shown by establishing that respondent has inflicted or attempted to inflict <coughs> bodily harm on another person. By his or her threats or actions, the respondent has now, these are the two new words. I say new. These are the words that are different than the mental health statute intended to. The mental health statute is just the respondent has placed others in, in reasonable fear of <coughs> physical harm to themselves. The then judiciary felt that it was uh, a better policy to make clear that the respondent is actually not doing that inadvertently, but is actually <coughs> intending to place others in fear of harm. And how's that shown? Uh, I think it's going to be circumstantial evidence, you know, that, that uh, of the person's past conduct or a uh, person's conduct with respect to uh, other people. Um, procedurally, it's got to be, at this stage of the game, it's got to be in the affidavit. Right? Um, but, but you're right that, as we said, or saw earlier, the affidavit's got to have specific facts in it that support the, the allegation of imminence. So, you know, the officer, you know, asserting that either maybe they saw the person do this or that, or, or another person uh, told the officer that the person did A, B, or C. Uh, those things could all be included in the affidavit. And so intended, you know, somebody intended to be, again, to be fact specific, or just what, what exactly. people said or showed or text yep. or email, you know, whatever. I think you're 100% right, yeah. Sort of the facts of the <coughs> individual case for sure. And lastly, you could show. Oh, sorry, yeah. Does oh, that sorry. extend down through guard letter B? That whole thing that's similar to the mental health. No. no. Well, it, it extends in the sense that that this is how B is how you show extreme risk of harm to self. So, so it extends from in the sense that that is what you have to show. If you see, if you go back up here to what you have to show in order to get this order, you have to show that they they pose this risk of harm to himself or herself or another person. So what you just identified is, is how you would show it uh, to self, to themselves. When I just was talking about Italian. I'm just wondering if that's the mental health language. It is. It's yep. all part of that. Yep, language. exactly. It's all right out, cut and pasted from there for sure. Thank you. Yep. Um, and lastly, there you can see that you could also <coughs> demonstrate the risk of harm to others by showing that the, that the person presented a danger to persons in his or her care. So some, somehow a danger to persons that they have responsibility or to care for. Um, so all right, uh, the, as I say, that it, so we're assuming that we're at the, at the stage of the game now that this, the order has been, has been issued, right? Or this is if the court, because we just went through what the court has to find in order to, in order to uh, issue the order. What happens next? Well, um, as I mentioned, as you see in line 16 and 17, there has to be a hearing within 14 days to determine if the final, final extreme risk protection order should be issued. I see there's sort of an exception there in lines 15 and 16, unless it's voluntarily dismissed. So the thought there is that, you know, <coughs> as we mentioned, this is an imminent harm, right? This is happening in a, in a crisis situation. <coughs> and there's 14 days during which, uh, well, a maximum of 14 days before, before this hearing is going to be held. It's always, it's certainly possible that during that period of time, whatever crisis happened is going to abate, right? The, the, the main, the, whatever the crisis situation had happened may no longer be that the person poses this imminent threat uh, of harm to him or herself or to someone else. So the, uh, the bill provides uh, the prosecutor with the option of voluntarily dismissing it during that period. You can see that on, I'm on <coughs> page 9 now, 
uh, the prosecutor can voluntarily dismiss at any time prior to the hearing uh, if, uh, if they determine that the respondent no longer poses this extreme risk of harm to himself or herself. So uh, the idea there is that you, know, you don't want the, the certainly not be an efficient use of resources to require that this hearing occur if in the meantime you know, the situation is resolved somehow. So this uh, allows for the case to be dismissed. And if that happens, you see line 629, if, if the prosecutor does voluntarily dismiss, then the court vacates the temporary order and directs the person in possession of the weapon to return it um, to the respondent, because presumably they're not a danger anymore. Um, just quickly going back there, because at the bottom of uh, page 8, um, if it's not voluntarily dismissed, this temporary order expires when the court grants or denies the final motion. If you think about it, that makes sense, because you've got this temporary order in place, right? Um, and so let's say the hearing is set for 10 days later. Well, at that moment, 10 days later, there's going to be uh, uh, a final hearing and a final order, and they're either going to grant the petition or deny it, right? And, and if, they, if they deny it, then it makes sense for that temporary order to go away, right? If they grant it, well, then they're issuing a final order. You don't need a temporary order for that under that circumstance either. So at that moment, temporary order goes away, unless they voluntarily, dis voluntarily dismiss it. Um, so what's in the order? And that's the, we've got, uh, you know, what are the contents of this temporary order? Basically, it says it prohibits the person from purchasing, possessing, and receiving a dangerous weapon, having a dangerous weapon within the person's custody or control for a period of up to 14 days. So we got, and we just went to class for that long. Has to be in writing, signed by the judge, include the sort of things you would think would be in there, a statement for the grounds, uh, and, and a lot of this is also from the RFA statute, I should say, some of this language. You know, names and address of the court, where filings are made, uh, all sorts of basic essential <coughs> information to have. This crucial point, lines 19 and 20, date and time of the hearing. So that's, that's gotta be in the order. So the person is informed when they're served with the order, here's when I can show up and contest. Again, has to be scheduled as soon as reasonably possible, but in no event more than 14 days after the issuance of the order. Um, so this this language here is also very, very similar to the RFA statute, basically informing the person of his or her rights. You know, they're having their, their property taken, this, uh, stating how long it's going to be in, in, in effect, that they have to turn their weapons over, um, that they're not allowed to purchase or possess them weapons while the order's in effect, uh, that the hearing, a hearing's gonna be held, um, that if you don't show up at the hearing, you know, judgment can be entered against you, you can talk to a lawyer, you know, basic procedural protections for, uh, to provide the person with notice of what's going on, basically. Because remember, they haven't appeared, right? They were there at this ex parte hearing, so this is kind of, may well be their first uh, uh, information that they have about what's happening. Now, See if lines 18 through 20 on page 10 strike anybody as familiar. Court may issue an ex, ex parte extremist protection order by telephone or reliable electronic means pursuant to this subdivision if requested by the petitioner. So, uh, as you know, <laughs> I know the committee spent a fair amount of time on this subject in, in another context, in the RFA context, interestingly enough, uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, so, uh, that procedure, essentially, uh, based on both, uh, this is when I asked you what the number, H69? H36. H36, thanks. <laughs> both, based on both H36 and, which in turn, which is itself based on the warrant uh, rule 41 of the Vermont Rules of Criminal Procedure though, that allows uh, uh, law enforcement officers to get a warrant electronically, right? So that's where this language comes from, where the concept comes from, obviously modified a little bit to fit this situation. Um, but the idea behind this, if you think about it, is to sort of what, what the purpose of the concept is. Uh, and this also, I should, add, I should uh, mention, was added in committee. So this, this electronic issuance provision was not in the bill as introduced. And I think uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee downstairs um, wanted to address, after hearing testimony, uh, they realized that, that although the ex parte order had, had an ability to be quick in the sense that you, know, you don't have to provide notice uh, to the person whose firearms it is, this is the kind of thing which may well take place sort of at a crisis scene, right? And you're, you're, you're actually at the scene when you might most 
need to try and get an order as quickly as possible. So this is an attempt to address that situation, uh, to, to create a procedure, uh, which I'm sure rings a bell <laughs> for you guys, that uh, allows this to be done uh, over the phone and through email uh, while the officer is on the scene. So um, that's the big picture. Uh, the way it works is that uh, the, um, a request is made, and I should say, and I think it says so right here, uh, well, it's generally true, you don't have to say it. Remember, these can only be requested by the SA or the AG, right? So the law enforcement officer can't him or herself make the request, but the, it's envisioned that they will contact someone from the SA's office or the AG's office who would then get in touch with the court to get the order. And did you say that other states do allow law enforcement, or, just, or was it family members? So no, do, no. So other states do, uh, allow, many do. Yep. do allow law enforcement officers? Yes, yeah. Um, I think they also yeah. may have other prosecutors as well, but law enforcement officers are, are included in most, if not all of them, I think. Um, yeah. So the NSA or AG can, uh, can ask the, the court for uh, the issuance of uh, one of these ex parte orders electronically, and if that's the case, then the, then the judge tells the practitioner um, uh, that this can be done. Now, I think the, envision, the thought here is, um, I don't want to speak for Judge Gerson, but I think that part of the thought here is that you know there's going to be forms in place, and you actually see language in, in the bill that requires it. And that also is identical and actually just taken from the RFA statute, in which a lot of these things are done by form, so you don't have to be sitting there you know, writing a three-page memo. There's boxes you can check and things like that to sort of speed the process along. Um, so uh, lines four and five, the affidavit uh, can be administered and sworn to over the telephone by the judge. To the person who's calling in, right? So they administer the oath over the phone. They swear to the affidavit, and then um, and then the affidavit uh, and the uh, motion are submitted electronically. So it could be email, could be fax, uh, could be could even be text. Uh, whatever electronic method uh, works under the circumstances, and then based on that, uh, the judge decides whether or not to grant the motion and issue the order. Now, if the, if the motion is granted, the judge signs the order immediately and enters on its face the exact date and time and transmits a copy to the person who filed for it by a reliable electronic means. So that means they email it back. You know, sign the order, email it back. If you think about the, the way that that can unfold quickly, they email the order back, and the law enforcement officer in this uh, electronic uh, issuance situation is probably envisioned to still be on the scene. And remember, they can serve it, right? They can then serve the order, because that's who can serve the things remove the person's weapons, and um, it all can happen, in theory, very, very quickly. Uh, after that happens, and that, uh, as you see, what I just said is they're in line 13 and 14, they have to serve it on the person who owns the weapons. After that, remember, this has all been done at this point by these fax copies, right? Really, none of these are the originals. They haven't been sent to each other, because when you, know, you email it to somebody, they're downloading it themselves, but the person who sent the email is the one who still has the original signed one. Right. So this says, all right, what do you do with these original signed copies? They have to be filed in court the next business day. The person who filed for it has to file the original motion affidavit, because remember, they've got those original signed copies. And the judge has to file the original signed order, because the judge has the original that they signed and emailed back. The clerk then enters the documents on the document, on the, sorry, on the docket immediately afterward. Uh, I just mentioned, too, forms have to be provided by the court administrator. Uh, there's some boilerplate language that has to be included in the, in the orders, and this is also similar to what's in the RFA, that the violation of the order is a crime subject to uh, fine and imprisonment, and the affidavit as well, that making a false statement in the affidavit is a crime. Um, Excuse me, Martin. Yeah, I was going to let but, well, so, so you, you said a couple times that, that and, and I, maybe I'm just missing it, that that's when, you know, with the order, then the weapons are removed. And where in here does it explain exactly that the weapons are removed as opposed to surrendered, or, you know, or is that not spelled out? No, it is or spelled am I out. Missing? I, I, I may have just missed it. No, no, we haven't, we haven't got to it yet. There's a section in the bill okay, thank you. On, on removal and... Yeah, okay, and how to get the weapons exactly. Right, yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, but you're right, that, that uh, has to be explicitly in there. Right, right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, from this section, and I've always 
as we've been talking about the RFA orders in particular, trying to figure out how do you overcome the hurdle of the fact that there has to be an electronic communication, as I understand it, email or fax or something um, uh, that actually the, the writing of the affidavit has to be transmitted to the court. Is that, that true? Uh, I think that the, that the affidavit can be administered over the phone and then um, the, uh, yes, and then I think the, do you mean the, 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 I mean the original or, or the? Well, so what I have, and maybe I've misunderstood it, and that would actually be a good thing in this case, um, that the court needs to receive a, some sort of written, maybe I should wait and ask um, Judge Bruce when he comes up here, but uh, some sort of written document electronically, right, um, and then can administer the oath over the phone. And the difficulty that comes up in some instances is that there's no cell reception, there's no, uh, they don't have email, they don't, there's not a way to get that written document to the court. And right. my question is, if none of these are originals anyway, to start with, why can't someone dictate over the phone the, you know, the, what's in their, what's going to be in their affidavit, <coughs> what's in their, in that request for the order <coughs> and then swear to what they've just said or, or they swear ahead of time that what they're about to say is right right is there a, is there a legal uh something a legal prevention to that and and, and again i, I i'm sure assuming right. there is right. but yeah right. and we can we can wait till you're up in a stick can't dictate the, the documents have to you have to create a record of what has been presented to us um, and just stating it over the phone isn't going to create the record um, it's like search warrants we do them electronically but if you cannot do it electronically somebody's going to come to my house present me the affidavit the complaint and I'll sign the order but we have to create the record is what it, what's necessary and by dictating it, there will not be any. Um, so where were we? All right, so the originals have to be filed the next business day. Actually, so we're, we're, sorry, we've got to the end of this ex parte uh, process, though. Just a little point about the reasons if it's denied, the court has to state the reasons for the denial. Um, so that is actually it as far as the ex parte process goes. So I'm going to. Now, move backward to forward, because remember, uh, if, someone, if one of these ex parte orders is issued, uh, unless they dismiss it, there's got to be a final hearing uh, within the next 14 days, right? And, uh, and I'm going to go a little bit more quickly through here, because a lot of this is very similar to what we just looked at. But, so if I'm skipping over something too quickly, flag me. Uh, but, um, uh, oops. So. Now we're at the, you know, the, the 10 days or the 14 days uh, is, is passing. And during this time, uh, um, the state's attorney or the office of the attorney general, who's ever uh, the prosecuting officer, uh, may file this petition for the final order. Um, and again, uh, you see here that it uh, um, prohibits the person from having a weapon, same as the initial order did. Has to submit an affidavit, same way the, the ex parte one did. Um, now here's a difference though, you see in subsection B, top of page three, except as provided in section 4054, which is the, temp which is the temporary ex parte piece we just looked at. Court shall grant relief only after notice to the respondent and a hearing. So in this case, respondents, uh, the person who owns the weapons is always gonna have notice and an opportunity uh, to appear. Um, so you see the, the person who's filing the prosecutor has the burden of proof here, line three, by clear and convincing evidence. See that? So at the final hearing, the burden is much higher on the state in order to, sh in order to have the, because there's no longer, presumably, an imminency of danger, right? There's no imminency at this point. And this is going to be, if granted, it's in effect for a longer period of time, up to 60 days. So the state's got to meet a higher evidentiary burden, clear and convincing evidence. 
which generally means a reasonably certain, highly probable. You know, very different than more likely than not. Right? Um, and, and again, um, other states do this at, at, at this point as yes. well. Other states yep. do it differently. Yep. Some do, some don't, exactly. Yeah. Some do, I think, clear and convincing at the final, Connecticut, California, I think, and there's a couple that are preponderance at the final as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Just a quick question, yeah. Eric, on page two there. When you're talking, when um, little A, uh, on line 17, yep. a state's attorney or the office of the attorney general. Now, at which point does the attorney general step in? Is it that the uh, state's attorney can't be... Uh, you can't make contact with them, or it's a case that that the uh, state's the attorney general's staff is working on. How does that all play out? Either of those could happen. Like you know, and because you think of the first one, it's happened in a sort of a time sensitive situation, right? right? And then it might be <clears throat> it's kind of a, the law enforcement officer presumably is at the scene, and they're going to have to make a call as to who it is. You know, maybe it's because they know somebody's on staff. Maybe it's uh, you know, I, I it's a sort of a presumption, but I I. I I would think that if this uh, bill passes the same way that this is, that sort of a a structure will build up behind it the same way it has with RFAs, right? So there's right. some experience, as people develop experience with it, they, and perhaps the courts, or sorry, the state's attorneys and the AG designates people to receive them at mm -hmm. certain times. So, um, again, I'm not trying to wet anybody, <laughs> so, but, but I you. think that sort of structure is with the way would be the way it would work in practice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's to be noticed in a hearing. Uh, now you see here. So what, what does the petition have to allege here again that you don't see or what you should you, you won't see? There's no word imminent here, right? They have to allege that the person poses an extreme risk. Remember in the in the ex parte it was imminent and extreme. So no need for imminency at this point because at this point this is a, a, a full evidentiary hearing. You know there's been notice provided. Um, and the sort of time-sensitive nature of the potential risk is supposedly, in theory, is not there at this point. Um, but otherwise, the standard's the same, and it's exactly the same. The only thing we're different is imminency. So they have to show that um, by possessing the weapon, they're posing a, danger, uh, a, a risk of harm to himself or others, himself or herself or others, right? Um, and the, uh, the definition of extreme risk of harm is the same that we just looked at, it's identical. Affidavit, similar, it's actually the same stuff has to be in there, facts supporting, dangerous weapons. Uh, there's an additional provision here that, uh, you know, prior existing orders that may be, have issued against the person, abuse prevention orders or orders against stalking or sexual assault. Um, now again, within 14 days after the petition, they have to have a hearing. Uh, this, uh, and in this case, notice of the hearing is served this makes sense, remember, because this is not an ex parte proceeding. This is one in which the person is getting notice. Um, lines 10 to 11, uh, court grants the petition if it finds by uh, clear and convincing evidence at the time of the hearing. Now, that's important because, it, it, you know, the, the finding here, again, has to be uh, uh, at the time that the hearing takes place. So it's not enough that the person may have been in danger seven days ago. It has to be at the time of the hearing. And again, that fits with this notion that you know, the prosecutor has the, has the option to dismiss if the person is no longer dangerous. Um, so if, if the court does make that finding, uh, you see on line 18, this is in line 17 and 18, it, the order will prohibit the person from having a weapon uh, for up to 60 days. So you got a longer period now, this is the 60 day period. Again, the, or, the contents of the order, very similar, has to be signed and include the statement for the grounds, uh, where filings are made, how you appeal, uh, requirements for relinquishment, for example, on this is kind of what you were getting at earlier, and we'll get to the, the cross-references to the section that talks about, well, okay, how, what's supposed to happen, right, with the actual weapon, how does it get relinquished? Um, description of how to request termination, you'll see when we get to it, the, the, the statute um, allows a person who's subject to one of these orders to file a motion to terminate it one time during any period that the order is in effect. So if it's a 40-day order, one time during the 40-day period, the person who's subject to it can go into court and file a motion and say, hey, terminate this order, I'm no longer dangerous. Where are you 
Uh, I, well, I was I was on line seventy nine there on page five, but that's uh, uh, that's sort of a reference to the ability to make that. We haven't actually got to the section that, that describes the motion to terminate itself. This is just saying when you give the person a final order, it has to say right in it, "Hey, you can file a motion to terminate," and here's and not only that, here's a form <coughs> that you can file with it too. Um, And you see subdivision F there. Uh, this is a, this directs a statement directing the law enforcement agency, approved dealer or other person to re, uh, to release it to the owner upon expiration of the order. So this is a statement that, hey, when the order expires, the order the weapon has to be turned back over to the owner. Uh, and this I'm gonna this language is, again is identical to this this the language that we saw in the ex parte order that informs the person of his or her rights. That's all exactly the same. Uh, again, about uh, uh, the, the reason for <coughs> denial have to be in there as well. Uh, you see in subsection G there, no filing fee required for the petition. So again, the idea is to try and make these actions accessible to people. Um, court administrator has to make forms available. Um, and the similar boilerplate, uh, bold language, or cap block caps language, I should say, about violation of the order being criminal, as well as uh, it being criminal to make a false statement in the affidavit. That's all in there. So you can see there's a lot of similarity between the two. Yeah. Yeah. So in that statement, it says um, that you shan't, you uh, cannot um, purchase, possess, or receive a dangerous weapon, or try to do that, and then it says, or have a dangerous weapon in your custody or control, is there why the need for in your custody control as opposed to possess? What's the I think sometimes possession may be viewed as a sort of a more immediate, you know, like you may you may have a weapon stored somewhere. Um, and just I think the intent of the language is to um, cover that situation as well. That, you know, you, I think you're right. You could argue that well, it's in, in your possession. If it, even if you have it, you know, stored in, you know, a different location. Um, but I think the language is intended to kind of sweep broadly, just in case. Yeah. All right. So we've gotten through the temporary order and the uh, and the final order. So now we've got the situation where uh, the, let's say the order has been issued. The final order can be last for up to sixty days, right? Um, brings you to the next question of well, what could what are what are things that could happen next? And we just mentioned termination, right? This is section four zero five five on page twelve. Um, as I mentioned, you can see in subsection A, the person whose weapons this these these are can file a motion to terminate uh, one time during the effective period of the order. That's line eighteen. <clears throat> Now, if the motion is filed, the state still has the burden of proof by clear and convincing evidence. So in other words, the court, as you can see kind of at the bottom there, the court has to grant the motion and terminate it, in which case, you know, you return the weapons to uh, the owner, unless it makes this clear and convincing finding, again, that the respondent continues to pose an extreme risk of harm. So if the court can't make that finding, can't, can't find that the, that the person continues to pose this extreme risk of harm, got to terminate the order, give the weapons back. And, and for the extreme list of harm piece, does that still go back to to pursu uh, pers uh, pursuant to the things that are found that 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 are able to be included for the extreme list that we see on page eight? Yes. Yep. Exactly. The same stuff. Yep. Okay. You got it exactly. Um, so. Uh, but that can only happen one time during the effective period, right? So the, the, you know, the person can't keep filing these things over and over. It has to be a sort of a one-time option. Uh, but it, let's say that the, which I'm about to talk about for a minute, if the, the, these orders can get renewed for additional periods of up to 60 days, right? So if the order, the first one expires at however many days, 45, and then they issue another order for 45, the person could file a motion to terminate one time during that second uh, period that's in effect as well. And that renewal uh, authority is right here in subsection B. So the state's attorney or the AG can file a motion asking the court to renew one of these ERPO orders. That's line six, uh, issued under 4053. That's the final order section. So if a final order has been issued, there can be a motion to renew it 
for an additional period of up to 60 days, right? So you can have one, you know, another period. And, and um, uh, you see that the language on line six and seven, you can renew an order issued under this section or section 4053. That provides the authority. There can be successive renewal motions. You know, in other words, uh, it doesn't have to be just, you can renew it just once. <coughs> if you renew, it, if you, if you, uh, renew the order under this section for another 60 days and that 60 day period gets toward the end, prosecutor can file a motion to renew again, provided that they can still, uh, you know, meet the meet the standard of showing that the person poses an extreme risk. Are, so, are the, yeah. Are the procedures and the um, time periods in here the same as for involuntary commitment, renewing those orders, or is this different than? It's, it's different, yeah. You mean the involuntary mental health commitment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're different, but I don't, uh, I don't know exa the exact numbers, but I can check on that for you. Right. No, I ha that's a good question. I hadn't tracked it for that reason specifically. No, no it, was, it was based on this. This procedure is in the other state statutes that have these ERPO things. And as Representative Grad was saying, um, as introduced, it was <coughs> a maximum of one year. And the way the other states work was, you could file once during the one year for a renewal. And, uh, sorry, for a motion to terminate once during the one year. And then the state can file a motion to renew at the end of the period. So just based on that. How many times or how long can this process go on for? You know, indefinitely yes. or okay, and so until we'll I should until, unless until the person no longer until uh, well until uh, the state's attorney lets it expire, which is possible. Uh, but if you mean can the state's attorney or attorney general continue to file them, assuming they think they can show, they can meet that, that dangerousness standard, yes, they can. They, they can. And is there a point in time when, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 I guess for lack of better terminology, the uh, proceedings uh, stop and the person cannot, no longer get his uh, guns, weapons back, and he's added to the, uh, the firearms uh, restriction list? How does that all come into play, or, or is that addressed here? It's not addressed here. It's a, it's a separate thing because if you mean the sort of the, the people who are prohibited from, right. say, buying That's a firearm, exactly you get, you get caught up in a about. background check, yep. that kind of thing. No, uh, uh, this proceeding is unrelated to that background check. So that that uh, you know, the, there's a list of you know reasons um, uh, for which. A person is prohibited by, uh, under federal law, from possessing a firearm, and you have the Vermont state law in effect now as well, because based on criminal convictions. But remember, there's no criminal conviction here. So, uh, but if this again, <coughs> if the person is found to be uh, dangerous in possessing weapons, I would think that we'd want something in law that says, enough's enough. You're on the you're on the restricted list from purchasing. Uh, firearms anymore, and so that at least that part of it's taken care of. It virtually makes no sense to me not to, you know, yeah. the, you know follow through with you sure. know, the next logical step as far as I'm concerned. Okay. The only uh, sort of limitation on your ability to do that is it's Congress who decides who's on that federally prohibited list. You know, you'd have to. You, you could, as a matter of state law, say that anybody who's been subject to one of these orders is, is prohibited from possessing a firearm. But, but that background check that's conducted by federal firearms dealers is all done through you know, the National Instant Criminal Background Check right. System. It's all federal. And you know, the list of prohibited categories is all in federal law. So um, I don't think anyone subject to this particular order is going to come into any one of the categories that are on that federal list. Somebody's dropping the ball, and I'm, I'm saying obviously the federal government. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Hello. So the motion's got to be accompanied by an affidavit. Again, it is a timing exemption. It has to be filed not more than 30 days and less than 14 days before the order expires, just to, so in order that there's notice for the person, hey, that there's going to be a motion to renew filed here. And otherwise, it's very similar. You see, it has to comply with the requirements of 4053. That's the final order that we just went through. 
moving party, that's the state's attorney or the AG, has the burden of proof by clear and convincing evidence again. So in other words, they have to show by clear and convincing evidence, and the court has to find, as you see here, um, uh, that the person, the person continues to pose, that's line 15, continues to pose an extreme risk of causing harm uh, to him or herself or another person through uh, <coughs> their possession of a weapon. So again, it's just a, a, a renewal of the same process that we've already went through. There has to be a hearing within 14 days. Um, the person has to get notice of it. The, uh, and all this stuff is similar. Sorry. The decision has to be in writing. There, again, there are forms for termination and renewal motions have to be provided by the court administrator. Um, all that we've already went through. Um, so we've gotten through, I think, what I would describe as you know the real bulk of the bill. Like we're going to go through a lot of procedure now, and then on the one last, there's a couple of other things that we'll go through. But I'm going to you know, probably pick it up even a little bit more now, but slow me down. Um, so for this next section has to deal with service. All these orders that we're talking about have to be serviced, provide, served uh, under the rules of civil procedure. We've also talked about that in this committee, you know, quite a bit this session. So that, as we know, generally means personal service by the sheriff or a law enforcement officer, right? Um, no tacking it to the door. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That'd be right. We can't do that. Can't nail it to the door. Um, uh, the uh, this language is uh, um, right out of the RFA statute. This has to, this addresses the situation. But what if the person is in court when it happens? Then you can deem the person served because they were actually there and heard the the court issue the order, right? But nevertheless, they still have to be served in writing. But the moment of service will happen right then. Um, so they can't say, well, I wasn't served, so I didn't know about it, right? Um, uh, now, this is also out of the RFA statute. It says to do with having ERPO orders uh, have to be served by law enforcement at the earliest possible time and take precedence over other summonses and orders. Um, you know, that's very, very similar language is in the RFA statute. Actually, all, this entire subsection there about them being served, they have to be served in a manner calculated to ensure safety of the parties um, and not include advance notification to the respondent. So in other words, you know, if, if you're about to serve an order on the person saying you can't possess weapons, the idea is you don't want, you know, the, the law enforcement officer to call them up and say, hey, I'm coming to take your weapons. Can you meet me somewhere or something like that? You know, it's the idea is it's calculated that, for that not to happen. Um, and there's a return of service stating when it, when it happened. Uh, now this is this is consistent with what we looked at before. Remember in the final in the final uh, um, final order and the renewal order situation, uh, you know the person has to have notice. The ex parte one, you know they don't get notice. It just it's just the person. So this clearly says. Um, if service of, of, of the notice of hearing cannot be made before the hearing, the court shall continue it and extend the terms of the order upon request of the petitioner for such additional time as it deems necessary to achieve service. So you can't guarantee that the person's going to show, but you can guarantee that they get served at least with notice of the hearing. So that they can't, person, uh, it's a matter of, I think, procedural fairness as well as making sure that um, the person can't later say, hey, no one ever told me that there was a hearing coming up, right? You have to get notice of it. Whether they show up at the hearing is then up to them, but they at least have to be served by a law enforcement officer with an order saying this hearing's coming up. Uh, procedure generally. Hey, Eric, just yeah. To be clear, so um, the RFA procedure A, B, and C are all like that. Is D, yep. D is the same as as RFA? Uh, I I believe so, but let me double check that. Um, so generally speaking, the rules for family proceedings are what govern what happens here. <clears throat> You'll see this also is from the RFA statute about the court administrator establishing procedures to ensure access after hours or on weekends and holidays. Well, that's consistent with what we were talking about as the electronic issuance of the order. Um, all that language is right out of the RFA statute in subsection B there, uh, and as well as subsection C. So that's identical for how to ensure after hours access. Uh, and um, how the court administrator can do that um, and make sure other courts know what's going on. 
So there's a criminal penalty section too, which you may have, you know we referenced earlier because there's that big block capital language that has to be in the order saying, hey, if you violate this order, it's a crime. Well, this is the crime, uh, as well as uh, the authority of law enforcement officers uh, to enforce these orders. Um, so uh, the orders can be enforced by law enforcement, and the person who intentionally violates one, you see subsection B1 there, they intentionally commit an act in violation of it, it is a one-year misdemeanor, although uh, they intentionally violate after they've been served with notice of the contents. So again, notice before uh, they're subject to these consequences. Subdivision two, if you file uh, a petition knowing that the information is false or with the intent to harass the person who owns a firearm, that's also a one-year misdemeanor. Subsection C is very similar to the RFA. A violation of an RFA uh, is up, may be prosecuted as criminal contempt, and same thing is uh, placed here as a potential remedy as well. We now get to relinquishment, storage, and return. Okay, uh, what happens, what does the person do, do with the firearms once one of these orders is served? Now, at this stage, there's a distinction. You know, Up until now, I, we've always been talking about weapons, right? And by weapons, we meant explosives and firearms, right? <coughs> In terms of storage and relinquishment, there's a bi bifurcation that happens. They're treated differently because, you know, you uh, don't, probably not good policy to be returning explosives to someone from whom they've been taken. So um, to address that, the, uh, the decision was to treat explosives differently, and so... Um, you see here that a, a person who is required to relinquish a dangerous weapon other than a firearm. Well, if it's other than a firearm, remember by the definition, what does that mean? It's an explosive. That's the only thing that's covered. Uh, that the person has <coughs> shall, upon service of the order, immediately relinquish the dangerous weapon to a cooperating law enforcement agency. So, uh, only option is to give it to a law enforcement agency if it's if it's an explosive. And what does a law enforcement agency do with it? They transfer it to. Uh, uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives for proper disposition. They have an office, field office in Burlington, um, and uh, uh, the assumption was that they would uh, know how to dispose of these explosives. So are, are there other, I assume there are other laws that forbid having explosives to begin with? Or yes. are there explosives that one can <coughs> legally possess that they would have to give up? Uh, the answer to that is yes, to both. The there is there is, there's a chapter in Title 13 that criminally imposes criminal penalties for the possession of explosives that aren't held subject to a permit. There's an old law that permits someone to have them by permit. Uh, but yes, um, they decided the decision was to let BAT figure that out whether or not it should be returned to somebody because hey, I've got explosives rather than try and figure it out. But um, so proper disposition exactly. might not mean they might be holding it. Might mean they check on the, the permit, right? Right. right. If they have a permit. Okay. That's right. Exactly. Now, if it's not an explosive, which means it's a firearm, um, then this re the rest of this language will also probably all seem familiar to you, and I won't need to go through it all in detail because this is uh, more or less exactly the same language <coughs> as we passed in the fee bill, uh, Act 91, a couple years ago for purposes of relief from abuse orders. Remember, we there was uh, uh, an initiative, I think, from, from the governor's office at the time, but it came to this committee first to, uh, to develop a procedure whereby firearms that are seized um, or removed in an RFA situation can be stored. They can be stored by a law enforcement agency by a federally licensed firearms dealer who wants to cooperate and they can charge a fee or remember by a third party <coughs> if they submit an affidavit and if the court um, approves so that the person could have a friend hold on to their weapons while the while the order is in place and so remember how all that whole process worked well the same process is just uh, uh, repeated here so that not with respect to explosives those have to be given to uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms to ATF, but for firearms, uh, they can be uh, held by either uh, law enforcement, a dealer, or by someone who the owner knows if uh, they can, you know, uh, provide an affidavit saying they're going to 
hold it for as long as they're supposed to and not give it back during that time. So that's a long way of explaining several pages of, or at least a couple pages of language here, but you've seen it all before a lot. So um, I can go through more details of that if you want, uh, uh, but it's all exactly the same. Um, I see if there's anything in here that, that was any different. Um, uh, here, yeah. Just a quick question. Uh, since I'm new and I wasn't here for Act 91, yeah. um, the court found that the relinquishment to the other person will not adequately protect the safety of any person, and the court's supposed to make that finding. Is there some place that lays out on what basis to make that finding? Or if that's something we should discuss offline because it's familiar to other people, I'm happy to no, no, it's it's uh, it's just it, it's left to the discretion of the court. It's it's a broad, it's broad language, I think, but um, um, it's it's left to I think the particular facts of the individual circumstances to make that decision. There's not not any more more clear definition provided. Okay. Yeah. 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 <coughs> recently, oh. no, go ahead. Well, I, I, maybe you might want to uh, check with the judge because we we had testimony recently about. Eric, when it yeah. comes to <coughs> a federal wire firearms licensee yeah. holding these weapons and they're allowed to to charge for the storage of them. If I remember correctly, when we took this up a couple years ago, that was a hotly contested bone of contention, I guess is about the best way I can is that addressed in here like the amount of fees that can be charged or yep. how is that set up? It's it's just it's just tracked on the same language. But it does the same same thing um, in terms of the uh, uh, <coughs> trying to find the fees section here. Uh, uh, well, they they uh, so the sale language is also the same. Remember, if it's if it's not retrieved. Uh, within uh, 90 days after the order expires, or after the court orders it being released, then it can be sold for fair market value. That's also identical to what's in that statute. Um, the Well, the, 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 as far as I know, uh, I remember that discussion that you're talking about. Um, the, the language here isn't any different than that. So if that, if that dispute or disagreement is still ongoing, th this isn't going to change that one way or the other. Um, you know, uh, I'd like to say, I'm just curious because I remember... I don't remember what I had for breakfast, but I remember that was being, <laughs> that was pretty contentious. Yes. If I remember correctly. Yeah, I remember it also. It was before your time. I'm telling you what you had for breakfast. I couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, so as I say, that is all all identical to what you have. Um, uh, And oh, actually, this is uh, uh, this last subsection H is is uh, worth mentioning. So this this says uh, notwithstanding all these other sort of rules that we've talked about uh, regarding taking possession of these firearms and storage and sale and that sort of thing, there are a couple of situ circumstances under which uh, weapons are not going to be taken, uh, and that is the first one, uh, or not returned at least. So if if a weapon has been removed under this procedure. It's not going to be returned to the person if the respondent's possession of the weapon will be prohibited by state or federal law. So, for example, the person is, you know, a convicted felon who is prohibited by federal law and state law now from possessing a firearm. They're not going to give it back to them, even though they're, you know, generally speaking, a firearm is returned after the order is is no longer in effect. So this just sort of puts a sort of a blanket uh, prohibition on returning it to someone who is legally prohibited from possessing a firearm. Uh, and also makes a provision here in subdivision two that they're not going to take it into possession in the first place uh, if it is being or may be used as evidence in a pending criminal matter. So 
obviously we're not going to take it if it has to be used for purposes of a criminal case. Uh, last provision here is that it's the, one of these, uh, the final order or the order for renewal is appealable to the Supreme Court. And lastly, the effect, uh, the act, sorry, takes effect on passage. So I know that's a lot. There's a lot of uh, a lot of court procedure, a lot of detail in there. So thanks for bearing with me. I know it's uh, uh, a lot to it, but uh, covers it for now. Yeah. So where, where in the, this bill I heard, and I just want to get it confirmed. Um, d does this incorporate any of the language we have in 422, or is it the concept that it addresses? Issue we tried to address in 422. I, I noticed you mentioning RFAs and lots of places where sure, you do language, sure. but I was just yeah. wondering how 422 intersects with this one. I think it's the latter point that you made. It's the it's the uh, the discussion downstairs. Uh, I think recognized the need to address a uh, a dangerous situation in the moment that the situation is happening, and that's why they added. The electronic issuance of uh, of the order and the ability to apply for it uh, by email and have the affidavit done over telephone. So that was, although the, as as far as I know, there isn't any language of H four twenty two that's in this bill. I think that idea was uh, an effort to uh, address a similar concern. So would it be you who would kind of give us somewhat of a crosswalk so we understand what is supposed to be addressing our concern there, or is that other witnesses I'm just trying to understand how to, to make sure that we have everything covered there? By say that again? Well, I mean, would you do a crosswalk? Like here's what you did in 422, and, and here's where this is taken care of in 221. Or yeah, uh, yeah. You could hear some of that. I don't know if that's what the chair would want, or we would want, but that would be helpful certainly to me. To I've actually, I've, I've did a memo on okay. some comparing between okay. some of the provisions of each, so okay. I, could, I could pass that along to the committee as well. That's helpful. Yeah. yeah. Do you have one? I think witnesses. Yeah. Well, Right. Right. On that, I may like in that. Did you do one of those? Because I don't know. Oftentimes, when there's like two competing bills. You know, you all have done those little like side by side, so you can see how they compare. I mean, you have, is, is it kind of structured like that, or, or it's no? a narrative memo, but it does it, it kind of does the same thing. It, okay. it yeah. And then I I also did have a question about um, at least with respect to for your own maybe your own independent analysis, and maybe what also has been covered with respect to under the extreme risk of harm. Um, the um, uh, and the you know different ways to establish that. Sure. The, the little I, I, two eyes, the by his or her threats or actions, a reasonable person is intended to place others in reasonable fear of uh, physical harm to themselves. Uh -huh. I, I was curious about the speech component to that, and namely on the fact that, as you know, because there, there is you know developed case law, but both in, in, the, in the in our state and on the Supreme Court. Where people can say like really nasty, awful things, even things that sound like you know, in, you know, I said them themselves are bad, you know. And again, I, I'm I'm seeing on that you know, just it's not just actions; it says threats or actions. And so again, I was just I was just surprised myself thinking about like when you know Madonna said, you know, I, I I think a lot about a lot like about blowing up the White House. Things like I mean, those, which you know. I say in a box, like, whoa, oh my God, that sounds horrible. Yeah. And again, so I'm, I'm, but again, I think there's also protections there. The reason why we can say even really mean things, you know, as opposed to, you know, because I think that's why the act, typically, you know, words alone don't work. You have to forward the, you know, have to actually have some kind of proactive steps forward so it's not mere words. And I'm just wondering, did you all kind of go go through that analysis, or is that really been on, on that section? They did not talk about it downstairs, but I can tell you that that the that the you know the true threat exception to the First Amendment uh, sort of patterns that language pretty directly. A, a threat it's a threat uh, that places another person in a reasonable fear of physical harm mm -hmm. is generally a First Amendment exception. That's that true threat doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would that would be. 
a legitimate concern that you raised, but I think that's how the courts have carved out. Okay. Uh, it, you know, it's not something that you that you. In fact, there's been a big debate, and it wasn't uh, among among the courts on that as to whether or not uh, intent should be included or not. Because you know, what if you didn't intend that, but someone has that response? But at least <coughs> if you do intend it, intend to have that effect in somebody, make them fear. Uh, harm to themselves. They've carved that out as a First Amendment protection. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, the other concept that I'm just wondering what the discussion was downstairs is um, tying things, uh, and I and I can't. I'm guessing what it is, but uh, at the time of the hearing. Uh huh. Can you just share, was there much discussion or back and forth about that? Because, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to I'm so chuckling because mm. that was, uh, the, you have a witness who I'm okay, be far better wait. just because uh, that was, uh, I think it a, was a, a point that Judge Grierson uh, raised accurately, which is that uh, you want to be sure that, that the person poses this danger right at that moment and, and that you know, the order shouldn't be ba issued based on <coughs> what might have been the case five days ago, right? It has to be, it has to be, uh, <coughs> the evidence has to show that uh, even at that precise moment of the hearing, the danger is still posed. The facts that um, uh, create a danger for other people are still in existence <coughs> to justify issuing a court order. I mean, the scenario that I'm thinking of is, um, suppose <coughs> there's someone bipolar, and they're on their meds, they're off their meds. And so this idea that a snapshot in time is representative may not, in fact, encompass that reality. So I'm just wondering how, anyway, that's a no, that's an interesting point. That. Interesting point. Yep, I hadn't, hadn't discussed it uh, from that angle, but yeah, that's an interesting, interesting angle. That I will leave for the judge to address. Thank you very much. Eric. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, <coughs> we're ahead of time, and I don't think I know we don't have witnesses until tomorrow. But um, get, um, Judge Kuhn and Kara, could you? Is that best for you to go now? Yeah. Sure. Okay. I can start now. Um, I could be back here at nine tomorrow morning, yeah. and I could be back here for an hour in the morning. But then I yeah, well, we get started. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you'd like. Good afternoon. For the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, uh, speaking to S221. Uh, you know, I have uh, worked with Eric and I guess everybody on, on this particular bill. So, um, I, I guess in very general terms, uh, this process, this procedure, this whole concept of, of uh, extreme risk protection orders was unknown to me until about six weeks ago, uh, having read a uh, Sunday New York Times editorial on, on the subject was my first knowledge, and then a few weeks later, uh, Senator uh, Sears uh, and the committee presented their, their bill. Um, there is a uh, article in seven days uh, that uh, speaks to the I think the incident that prompted uh, Senator Sears to get interested in this subject so I have not read all there's about five states that have these bills uh, I have not read all of them in detail um, I have seen a chart that somewhat compares them and a lot of them are modeled on the relief from abuse procedures as this bill is um, there, at least it appears in Connecticut, uh, which is the uh, state that really started this process in 1999. Um, and they took an approach, as I read their bill, uh, instead of approaching it, um, at least at the outset, like a relief from abuse request, uh, more of a search warrant request. Meaning, I would uh, guess that you would have to show the, the imminent risk uh, or danger uh, to self or others, but what the search warrant would allow is, assuming there's a basis for the search warrant, would allow the police to then uh, confiscate any guns that they can identify by way of location or place. So in that sense, it's a, a broader 
initial approach uh, than the relief from abuse order. All we're going to be able to do is order uh, no possession of firearms or surrender. But um, where that leaves the police in the middle of the night, I'm not sure. So I think that's something the committee may want to uh, think about. I, I, sure. If you, if you, it appears, at least in Connecticut, that the process starts with what would be similar to a search warrant, meaning the police still have to contact us. They still have to provide a factual basis for the search warrant, but a search warrant would identify uh, where they believe guns are located, and the order would actually authorize them to search a particular place or places uh, for firearms. Um, as opposed to the orders that we're talking about here, for the most part, say um, that the individual can no longer possess firearms or purchase them um, and has to surrender or relinquish firearms. Um, but where it goes from there and what the police are able to do uh, in some respects is up in the air if the person doesn't surrender. So that's like, actually, that's like what we talked about in 675. <coughs> on the, the conditions of um, the disciplinary trial. Yes. The, the yeah, a similar discussion that we had had before. So I just, I bring that up just as someone asked about the different approaches, and that is an approach that is different than this, but it would have then assuming there's evidence, authorize the police at the outset to go uh, to search a person's home, or car, or vehicle, wherever they think that firearms are. So I think when the committee looks at this bill, um, Representative Lalon asked about 442, and I'm not going to get into um, in any comparison or analysis of that bill as opposed to this one. But the difference is that if I understand 442, you're talking about uh, at the scene of a domestic violence and obviously a criminal proceeding. Um, and this bill does not speak to criminal proceedings. You need to look at this, in my view, as a, a relatively narrow uh, population. And by that I mean it talks about a danger to self or others and although um, it incorporates much of the same language out of the mental health uh, Title 18 provisions for defining danger to self or others. The missing factor or element, if you will, is mental illness. So you start with a person who is not suffering from mental illness, um, but they are a danger to themselves or others. If they were suffering from mental illness, you had a mental health screener, that case would probably go via uh, civil commitment process and it could be voluntary at first, involuntary, but there is no timeline uh, akin to this. Um, so you eliminate that population because there's no mental illness here. It doesn't mean there may not be uh, mental health issues that are, um, someone else mentioned, uh, on and off medication. Um, so there clearly could be mental health issues at play here. But it also doesn't involve a relief from abuse order where someone has made a complaint because that would also allow us to issue an order, uh, ex parte, to uh, uh, prohibit the possession of firearms. So you're not dealing with a relief from abuse provision, and whatever the person is doing with this firearm or explosive doesn't rise to the level of a crime, maybe a disorderly conduct, or maybe just shooting a gun off um, that could be reckless endangerment. So you're left then without a mental health issue, without relief from abuse, without a crime of domestic violence or otherwise, with a very narrow population of someone who presents a risk. So that's why it's in a civil uh, context. It could have easily, I don't say easily, but, um, and it's, it's not anything I've discussed with the committee, but um, it's always been in the family division, division from the outset. Um, I suppose it could have gone into the civil division, but tracking it similar to relief from abuse, it makes sense for a couple of reasons to be in that docket. One, because you're modeling, at least this bill in its present form, models of, of many <coughs> parts, uh, components of the relief from abuse. But more importantly, it called for a hearing, uh, originally it said within seven days. And the reality is that our, our schedules um, are set out months ahead of time. So we just don't have a block of time where we could fit in any hearing in seven days. And you wouldn't want to bump, for instance, a juvenile proceeding uh, to accommodate this. Um, so I had suggested, and that's why the bill 
calls for 14 days so that we can fit this hearing in to essentially the um, block of time that every court sets aside every week for relief from abuse. So there would be a place to put these final hearings. Um, the, the ex parte uh, process uh, takes elements <coughs> of relief from abuse. Uh, the electronic processing of the orders really um, is a combination of relief from abuse and the search warrant provisions that we for a number of years have been allowed to process search warrant requests via electronics. Um, so that to a great extent is um, why the procedure is laid out as uh, relief from abuse. So when I look at the bill, um, let me go back for a minute. Because of what I view as a narrow population, I, I do not see this as having a significant impact on the number of filings in our court. Um, so it's the procedure and the process to get from uh, that late night call to a final hearing that is the primary focus of, of this bill or certainly the, the judiciary's response. The, the numbers for whatever they're worth out of Connecticut, which I don't know the population, but I assume there's millions of people living in Connecticut, from a 14-year period from 1999 to 2013, <coughs> they had about 760 of these orders. It's about 50 a year, um, with a, obviously a much larger population. <coughs> so again, I think that reinforces my thinking that this would not have a large impact on the number of filings. Right. And um, so Connecticut was a very convincing. They they start yes they start with probable cause um, again as I'm reading more of these statutes I'm understanding more they start with probable cause on the emergency <coughs> order that may very well be because they start essentially as a search warrant process which is clearly a a, um, a probable cause standard um, the difference is it's probable cause to establish location of firearms and extreme risk as opposed to probable cause for a crime but I, that may be why they start with probable cause because they're really starting with a different process. But then at the end, their final hearing does go to clear and convincing evidence. So do you think that's the reason that perhaps their numbers aren't as high? I'm, I'm sorry. Do you think that's the reason, perhaps the reason why their numbers aren't as high because of clear and convincing? If those are the number of filings, then no. I mean, you're going to start on a lesser standard than us, so it wouldn't prohibit someone or inhibit is the better word, inhibit somebody from filing, whether or not they, I don't know if that number is, um, that's the problem with quick reading, I don't know if that number is final orders issued or just the number of requests that they've processed over that time. Um, Follow-up question on that? The 736 uh, orders, is that is that just the final order since the other is just looking for a warrant for search, you know, the, the, their initial phase in Connecticut is probable cause in, in uh, for uh, a search warrant, so isn't, or search and seizure, I should say. So do, are those 736 orders inclusive of those requests? For I wish I could answer that, but I don't. This was a snapshot, uh, essentially a, a very one or two page summary of the orders, and they basically maybe asked. Well, would, it wouldn't be an order if they sought. Would it be an order if they were just came in seeking probable cause for a search warrant? If they call those orders, I don't know how they, they count again. That's what I'm call saying. Orders or warrants. Sorry, thank that, you. That's why um, hindsight being what it is, I probably shouldn't have thrown you that number because I don't know enough about it. But it struck me as for the length of time they've been in effect, whether it's applications filed or even if it is final orders, um, it's a small number over that period of time. Whether or not it's because the final standard is clear and convincing, there's no way of knowing as to how many were filed and uh, maybe withdrawn um, or not. Um, but clearly, I think the committee has to look at the, the burden of proof um, and that there was considerable discussion uh, by Senate Judiciary over that issue and they, they went back and forth to end up where they are, but clearly <coughs> recognizing that <coughs> on an emergency basis, you may want a less of a standard than you do for a final hearing because of the nature of, of, of a uh, emergency request. Your Honor, um, I don't remember if you were the one that said this. I believe it was during H422, uh, but um, 
uh, <clears throat> my recollection, you know, is correct. I thought with, when it comes to issuing one of those orders, <coughs> emergency orders, to go in to, um, to take the guns away from a person if they, uh, in, in a, <coughs> excuse me, in a um, uh, domestic abuse situation, that how, it almost, you're going to have to have somebody cooperating, giving, you, giving the police cooperating evidence as far as where those guns are located, how many there are, things of that nature. Um, <coughs> was that you that said that about 422 or am I? And, and so, and, and if it was, I'd like you to put, you know, put your thoughts into how tough it's going to be to execute one of these orders and come up with either different results where they're, where they're going to most likely be able to uh, seize all these weapons or not. Well, I think clearly that issue was discussed below as it was discussed in 422, and whether I was the person that made that statement, I think um, I think the way 422 was certainly discussed anyway, there's an issue, there's a difference in, in, in going to the scene of a domestic, and the, the gun or firearm is clearly involved in the incident versus one that may be present, plain view, um, or... There may be some other justification, um, <coughs> such as consent by one party to search a house. So it's hard to pin down. I think the issue, though, um, is framed in in this bill as to what it really means to say no purchase or possession of firearms. Uh, clearly, the one that's in the individual's hands, if that's the case, is easy. But if you order, surrender, or relinquish, we go back to the discussion we had the other day about what does that really mean and how do you enforce it. Um, one of the things, that I don't think it's a complete answer, but one of the things that is not in the bill, and I didn't notice it until rereading it yet again, but because it has mirrored the um, relief from abuse provisions, you'll remember when we were talking about relief from abuse a week or so ago, one of the final sections after the judge has issued an order and it's uh, then turned over for service is that um, it's filed with a so-called holding station, which is a central uh, location in each county for warrants um, and relief from abuse orders. So even though it's not in the bill now, you may want to consider adding that provision so that uh, it's at least in a central filing place. It will not go on the registry. You asked a question about that. So it doesn't prevent someone from violating the order. But at least if, if there is a, a central location where other police departments were made aware of the existence of the order, much like relief from abuse, it may enhance its, uh, the, the protection that you're looking for. Um, but th that issue of, you know, does this authorize the police just to go to someone's house? Uh, that's a whole separate issue. And, and, um, what did you call the holding station? The holding station. So I think that's really in, uh, the issue as to how far the police can go other than at the scene of the incident to determine other firearms um, is going to be clearly case, case dependent on whatever information they may or may not have. Um, so I, I don't know that I can answer it any better. Thank you. Um, I did notice, and uh, as Eric was giving his rundown on page 3, um, where it talks about the conditions or what we have to look for to uh, uh, establish extreme risk of harm uh, at the hearing stage. He was right in saying uh, under line 12 um, the respondent has intended to place others in reasonable fear of physical harm. Uh, that was for the most part taken from the Title 18 mental health definition, but there was added in uh, the the term intended, which changes the focus from a subjective uh, to objective, and um, I wasn't uh, downstairs when they discussed that particular edition. So, um, if it if it read the way the mental health statute read, I believe it just says um, has placed another in reasonable fear of physical harm. Um, which does change the, the element of proof. Um, when you're talking about intent, 
you have to consider other factors such as their mental health. Again, you mentioned something about being on and off medication, whether they're on, under the influence of substances, all goes into whether someone can form the intent to do this. So um, it may be, again, something the committee wants to discuss further and, uh, and, and think about in that regard because it's, it's not just the addition of the word, it changes um, the, the proof that we would be looking for and it, uh, the burden that the state would have in, in meeting that. To potentially a higher burden in some instances. If you're, if you're talking about what we refer to as specific intent to that your actions result in an intended result, it's a difference, it is a higher level of proof. It adds another element to it, it adds the element of um, mental intent. Um, and many of these folks um, may be dealing with those kinds of issues. That's why I said they they haven't risen to the level of mental illness. Doesn't mean there may not be mental health factors in, involved in, in these situations. So I, I point that out as a decision, really, for the committee to uh, to discuss. Um, and a lot of it, as Eric said, did mirror the. Uh, relief from abuse provisions. I'm just trying to see if I had any other specific comments. Uh, on page 11, 22, um, someone other than myself identified on line 16 that it shall file the original motion. It says fine. And I don't know if that was the question that um, Representative Conquest had about is that part of the normal practice now with relief from abuse? Uh, no, that was a different section. Yeah. But but that is part of it, that it has to be filed. And that's where I would suggest that um, might be an appropriate place if you're going to include the holding station somewhere in there when you get to the point in the process where the order has been issued and it's being served, that it would also be filed um, in the uh, holding, holding station. other judges. I just want to see if there's <coughs> like I said some of them wondered about civil process uh, the civil stalking provisions and I've addressed that. <coughs> others uh, asked about the volume of cases uh, my prediction is not a large number so it won't impact the relief from abuse docket obviously in some courts um, is very very heavily populated um, One of the, um, when you get into the area of termination and renewal motions, um, and, and let me go back for one minute. At the very outset of the hearings this afternoon, I think um, Chairperson Brad said something about a relief from abuse being like a relief from abuse order with a one year. Uh, any relief from abuse order is always up to the discretion of the court. So there's nothing automatic about one year, although I will say that in many, many cases it becomes somewhat of a standard, but um, there's no, I think the maximum now is five years that we could go on a relief from abuse order. It used to be unlimited, but they brought that down. So. Um, but when you get into the termination, and again, this is more of a policy decision, uh, uh, we're looking at, it begins on uh, page 12, termination and renewal motions, and you'll see at page, uh, line 17, a motion to terminate should not be filed more than once during the effective period, and Eric spoke to that. Um, so some of the questions uh, that I had are, you know, does there have to be a basis for the motion to 
change the order other than just saying I want to change this order. In other words, does the is the respondent in that case the actual moving party uh, by filing a motion saying there has been a change in circumstances that I can show that no longer warrants this order. The way the, the bill reads now, that the individual files a motion to terminate. It's not clear to me what, if any, grounds he has to include as a basis for that. But then it goes on to say that the state shall have the burden of proof by clear and convincing evidence. Um, that kind of reverses the norm usually when someone is the moving party. Uh, in the case, that they then have the burden of coming forward and proving, in this case, would be a change of circumstances. Um, so that is different than what we normally see in these modification um, processes. Um, and so again, I think it's something the committee needs to at least look at and decide that's so this, at least under the bill as it's written, this would be uh, terminating a permanent order. So the state has already proven uh, clear and convincing. And so it, it, uh, in nor normal circumstances, a moving party who wants to vacate something or uh, terminate in this case um, would have the burden of, of proving why it should be why the court should consider changing the order. And is their burden the same, the, the standard, usually? So In other words, is the burden to, to, so they, they to modify the order or terminate the order? Change the circumstances and they have to convince the court of that by clear and convincing? Or, or is there not a... The, the problem is an overgeneralization. In other words, there may be, I'm not going to say there may not be places where the burden remains the same, but it is not uncommon to have a different burden on a moving party saying there's no longer a need for this order. The, the state in this case has had the burden at the outset to prove by a, a very high standard. I mean, uh, keeping in mind that clear and convincing evidence is used in very very few situations. Um, the one that comes to mind most readily is uh, fraud cases, uh, where that's sometimes used. But it's usually either preponderance of evidence and by far the majority of civil proceedings. That's the standard in relief from abuse. Um, or if you're in a criminal docket, obviously, it's, it's um, beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so think you have to look at, okay, if the uh, respondent is the moving party, does he or she have the burden of showing what, why the order should be changed, um, and, and by what burden? Would you keep, in other words, just because it's clear and convincing at the final stage, it doesn't have to be that. Again, that's a policy uh, decision for, for the uh, committee to consider. Um, but this procedure is a little bit different in that the respondent files the request to change it, but then the burden shifts to the state to prove once again uh, that, that that risk or that the individual poses that risk continues. Um, and that's clear in uh, on page 13 at line 15. This is where they have sought an extension of the order, but it's the same. It, it, they, their burden would be to, to show that they continue to pose that risk. extensions of the order 60 days I mean I think you again have to look at if you've already met the burden of clear and convincing you're now asking to extend it Are, should the burden be the same when the state is seeking to extend the order so if you're extending the order though 
suggesting that in some some circumstances the 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 extension would be a lower burden of just a preponderance at that point or it, it could be it, it it is truly again a decision that the committee has to make for example in a relief from abuse uh, once an order is issued uh, and whatever length of time that the order is in effect uh, the person who has the benefit of the order can seek an extension of the order um, let's say it's a one-year order within that one year uh, the last month they'll file and request an extension of the order for perhaps another year uh, they do not have to show at that time uh, that abuse has occurred within that one year um, the court can continue the order at the same burden of proof as they originally had um, essentially based on the same facts that occurred a year ago uh, so when you have these requests coming in again the committee has to decide who has the burden what do they have to show um, in order to continue that you could say that they don't have to show any increase in that time they can the state could rely on the <coughs> same facts but I, I guess I'm not quite following the difference. So, as I already described the RFA situation, if there's a, a request for an extension, the court can grant it, um, but based on the same standard of preponderance. And, and, and I, what I didn't say and what I should have said is the legislature has put in the statute that the court does not, there does not have to be a finding of further abuse or violation of the order within that one year in order to grant an extension so i'm saying the stat the, the legislature created that which may not have been the case so that's why i'm saying it's careful that when you're looking at renewals and termination that you have to look at each one of them individually uh, and decide what should that burden be for renewal um, and if who's the moving party is it their burden properly and by what by what standard? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the clerk's office is closing and needs their clerks. I can come back. No, 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 just, just don't take some seconds. Do you use the notice 675? Was it 675 or did you mean a different? 675 is the um, No, I want a yes on that. It was the other one. Okay, okay so I, I just want to be clear because yeah. you would have said 675. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> no, 675, yes, the other one, no. Okay. But, yeah. Your Honor, I, so. I, I just want to make sure that I've got this straight in my head. Um, when it comes to the renewal, then if there is renewal really by the state, yes. Okay. If there's really no, for, again, lack of better terminology, burden of proof placed on the the, 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 the the proponents of the extension, does it fall back to the person who's had these, uh, uh, you know, this uh, order issued against them to prove that? Uh, circumstances have changed where they're now in a better position state of mind or, or otherwise to have the order dropped and to get their their weapons back if this if the state I think the best way to look at it is if the state is seeking the extension of the original order they're filing for that extension and the burden of proof is going to be on them to prove there is a basis for continuing an order for another 60 days so that, that's why the normal course is the person filing is the moving party right. and they have the burden of proof and I'm saying the committee has to decide at that point um, what will that burden be for renewal will it be the same as the final or something less um, and what facts what information does, does the moving party have to bring forward to warrant the extension and that kind of goes back to the question um, that you had about the facts and at the time of the hearing and what we had been talking about is there are some procedures for instance the juvenile uh, procedures mm -hmm. that when the state files a petition saying that the child is in need of care and supervision uh, today we may not have a hearing for two or three months down the road the state prevails on that petition based only on the facts that were in existence at the time the petition was filed. In this hearing, what you're looking at, the way it's at least set up at this point, is you're looking at what prompted the emergency request 
four or five weeks ago, ten days ago. And because of the nature of the request, being an emergency, you're looking at, at the final hearing, does that um, uh, same risk still, is it still there? So I would think by that, by, almost by definition, you'd want to see what's happened within that time frame, <coughs> unlike the, the juvenile petition. So that, that's why it says at the time of hearing, you're going to encompass not only the facts that brought you into court originally, but what's happened in the meantime. It may be that there was a, uh, an adjustment in medication. It may be the person has, or whatever the issue was, may have resolved itself so that the state decides not to proceed. So I think that's, it, but at the same time, if things have escalated, that supports a finding that the risk continues and therefore you don't want to limit them to the evidence that was in front of them that night. Um, but that was one of the, that issue of burden of proof um, and who has the burden uh, was a, a discussion that a, a number of judges presented to me when I sent the bill out to them for comment, um, concerned about, okay, who is the moving party and should the moving party, depending on what you're trying to do, normally is the one who has the burden of proof. Um, but it's a question of what that burden should be and what facts they have to show. Um, th that was, um, this bill, I think, for the nature of this proceeding, is something new to all of us, really. So um, I don't, none of us have had experience. So we're trying to figure it out along with the rest of you. But th those were the substance of my comments, but I'm certainly glad to answer any questions that the, the committee has. Any other questions? Hearing none? Getting's good. Thank you. I'm Kara Cookson. I'm with the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. And, um, you know, just as a reminder for folks in the room who aren't familiar with the center, um, by statute, the center is responsible for promoting the rights and needs of Vermont's crime victims statewide. And um, we're responsible for representing the interests of all crime victims, which includes homicide survivors as well as domestic and sexual violence victims. And I should also be sure to note that you know part of our interest in this is the our victims compensation program. You know, over the years, we have paid <coughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars on behalf of families um, to help them pay for funerals, buy headstones, uh, clean up crime scenes, and obtain mental health counseling to cope with their grief. Um, that is what brings the center here today to participate in um, this uh, hearing and to bring information about the legislation. Um, for us, it, the primary goal of criminal justice reform should be to change the paradigm from a system that doesn't just respond to crime, but to a system that prevents crime. And bills like S221 are certainly part of that, and we support the effort um, to bring S221 um, because it's one of the many tools that can be used to address um, <laughs> homicide. Ultimately, we see S221 as a homicide and suicide prevention tool. Um, and I think as the judge testified, um, based on the experience in Connecticut, um, the, the area where this tool might be most effective is in the realm of suicide prevention. And um, you know, at one point I was asked, well, you do homicide, you do homicide stuff, why do you care about suicide stuff? If you think about recent cases in Vermont, um, homicide and suicide go together and you never quite know <laughs> who actually might might be on the final end of a violent act if you think about, I mean, the Schumacher case in Essex. There's there's a lot of cases where um, trying to mince and pin down like who actually might be it um, in harm's way um, is taking us away from the conversation around preventing the harm. And I have some comments about the bill that get back to that issue as well. Um, 
another <coughs> you know, place where I think that this particular tool is useful are the cases that Judge Gerson was describing where um, someone has not yet committed a crime. Um, so cases where um, someone may have communicated threats uh, specified or not that would suggest an intent to commit a crime, but the person has not yet <coughs> done the other things that would rise to a level to establish probable cause. And the other thing that I think the committee should be reminded of is some of our existing criminal statutes like criminal threatening, disorderly conduct, um, even misdemeanor domestic violence, those are misdemeanors. Is that, and as this committee well knows, <laughs> with your work on um, bail and, and pretrial issues, um, committing a um, misdemeanor offense unless the person is a risk of flight from prosecution means that you know that person won't necessarily be held. And so again, having the tool to potentially remove weapons from a situation in those low, uh, well, in, particularly in the cr criminal threatening arena, what might be perceived as a low level misdemeanor is important in terms of addressing public safety risk overall. Um, so um, with that as background, those remarks, I'm trying to be mindful of your time, so I'm going to skip around a little bit. <coughs> Some comments on the bill. So on page, yeah, can I, <laughs> can I be, well, yeah, got it. Um, page three, line eight. Um, so we would, um, first of all, we would definitely reiterate um, Judge, Judge Grierson co uh, comments about in 2A, a uh, little 2, um, that there needs to be some form of subjective intent that the threats that are communicated put the person in reasonable fear of physical harm to themselves or others. Um, can you show me, tell me where you Sure, are. so I'm on, so that's on line 12, um, page, three. page 3. Yeah, yeah. so I, I mean, what's not uncommon in, in sort of <laughs> similar areas where we're talking about the communication of a threat is that it's a threat that would cause a reasonable person to fear their physical safety. And so that's how you take what would be a subjective standard and move it to an objective standard so that we're not... Um, engage in an inquiry that's looking at what's going on inside the head of the person so that it's a reasonable inquiry that you know if a reasonable person would consider it to to be a threatening then that uh, is sufficient so um, again so what what like how would what, so how would um it by his or her threats or actions um well by his or her threats or actions um a reasonable person um would fear for physical harm to themselves. I think would be how you would. Intent out altogether. Yeah. Right. Because intent. I mean, especially in an ex parte basis. I mean, what evidence are we going to have to show subjective intent? I mean, that's a pretty. There has. There's not a lot of time with that case at that point to even develop the subjective intent. Um, the other sort of overall issue as you're looking at. 2A and 2B, it's, it's setting up two different schemes here. Extreme risk of harm to others, maybe shown by these factors, and then extreme risk of harm to himself or herself, maybe shown by establishing that the respondent has threatened or attempted suicide or serious bodily harm. Um, one of the concerns in sort of dividing out these two factors is I think it's suggesting that the petitioner in this case is going to need to say this is the person who is being threatened or this is the this is the this is the person who could be subject to the harm, either the respondent themselves in a suicide situation or some other person. And and I think that if if these um, factors could be merged, so an extreme risk of harm to self or others may be shown by establishing and then lay out those factors. Um, you know, that way we're not requiring a judge to find that there's a, 
a threat against a specific person or that this is a suicide threat. Because again, if you look at so many cases in Vermont that are um, homicide suicides, I don't know that the players, if they had had a tool like this on the front end, we would have wanted to ask them, well, who, do, who specifically do you think is going to die? Or is this person going to, they're threatening to commit suicide. Are they, you know, what about the threat to other people? I, I hope I'm, it's the end of the day. I hope I'm articulating this clearly. I don't think that that's what we're asking the petitioner to be able to do, at, especially at an ex parte stage. Would you be able to maybe work with yeah, I mean, it's really simple. So, you know, 2A would just read um, the an extreme risk of harm um, to himself or herself or others may be shown by establishing that and list the first three factors that you have and then just list, le add the second half in B, which is um, that the respondent has threatened or attempted suicide or serious bodily harm. And then all of those various factors can be encapsulated into whether the person is a risk of harm to himself or others. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, on page seven, line six to seven, I think this might just be an oversight. I'm hoping this is an oversight. Um, let's see. So, <clears throat> this is for the emergency ex parte. Um, this, this uh, line begins, a law enforcement officer uh, may notify the court that an ex parte extreme risk protection order is being requested pursuant to the section, but the court shall not or issue the order until the motion is filed. And I consider that word filed to be a legal term of art, which, and, uh, although I would defer to the judge on this, my concern is that the perception would be, you know, that it's filed with the court as opposed to submitted electronically. Um, and because I think that that's what we're getting at with the ex parte <coughs> is, the, is the opportunity for it to be, um, for, for the order to be processed through these electronic means and that sort of suffices as the filing. And then the order is issued and it's effective upon issuance. Um, but. And I think what this section is really getting at here is the idea that the law enforcement officer can call ahead, but not until the judge actually has the affidavit and the motion and the materials should the judge be acting on it. So I think that um, on line seven where it says filed, I think what, you're, what you want there is submitted because the, the su subsequent sections talk about the submission of the supporting document. Um, so my next comment is on page 11. Okay, and this is going to be, oh, right, on page 11, line 18, you can see where that follows through with the electronic. Um, so that's, that's how that works there. Um, on page 12, the, the, we would echo um, the judge's comments on, the standard for termination. <clears throat> so the idea that a moving party isn't going to then bear the burden of proof. And I'll say that by comparison, um, under 15 BSA 1103, which is the RFA statute, after a final order has been issued, if the, um, in that case, if the defendant <coughs> or, or respondent to that order um, wants to change or terminate the order, um, they would need to show a substantial change in circumstances. So that's the language that's used there um, in order to um, modify or terminate a final RFA that's been issued. So if the intent is for these uh, provisions to match each other, that's what that would look like. Um, the other thing that I would point out, this is uh, so page 16, line 20. The, so, intentionally committing an act prohibited by the court or failing to perform an act ordered by the court, so in this case, the, per, the person who's going to be subject to this order is the person who's the respondent who's been served with the order, the, the violation is going to be 
um, imprisonment by not more than one year, so it's a misdemeanor offense to violate the order. Um, you know, I would submit that probably by the time, if, if this order has been issued and somebody has been found to be in possession or to have purchased a weapon, and that's been caught before it's a homicide, um, because that, or suicide, I mean, that's probably where we're headed. Um, you know, I just wanted to point out, and I know there are a lot of conversations in the committee about what penalties we ascribe to certain behaviors, but, you know, to the extent that this is getting a homicide prevention, again, it's a misdemeanor, if the person's not a flight risk, um, they'll probably be released on condition. And, and we'll go around the loop again, potentially. So, you know, I don't know where that uh, leaves us, but I'd be remiss if I didn't point that out again. Here. Did you testify down in the uh, Senate on this bill? Very briefly. At the time that I, the time that I was given to testify on this bill, um, the, the draft, which comprises most of what you see now, was not complete yet. <laughs> so I, so the original bill as introduced was what was actually before the committee. There was a working draft. Um, so I testified generally about the sort of concepts that I would want to see in the working draft, but I didn't actually have an opportunity to review the language that you see before you, if that makes sense. Well, it does, but with something this important, I would think that they'd almost give you carte blanche to come in and testify once, once you know the latest version was was drawn up. I think, um, I think, and this is very reasonable, and we fully support this. There's a lot of um, everyone is really eager to get work um, done on this quickly, and I think that that's probably a reason why there wasn't another day of testimony that would have given me an opportunity to make the comments. I, I mean. <laughs> I, I, you know, and I think and this is another place where we can hopefully um, make some of these adjustments, if to the extent the committee is interested. Um, so, um, the other thing, and this is what you've already heard this, um, the 60-day time frame for the final order is a pretty brief time frame. One of the ways that I think we could see this um, bill functioning, um, if we're really looking at it as a suicide prevention bill, is um, what this allows all the players to do is very quickly remove guns, one potential um, means of committing suicide from a situation so that the players can look at whether there are other tools that can be accessed. You know, can we, seek a Title 18 order, you know, that this person is a person in need of treatment. Should we, is there an underlying crime here in this given case, whatever it is, and, and then the state can um, file criminal charges if on further examination and, you know, investigation that, that ends up being the case. If it's a case where maybe there's a family member involved and we are talking about domestic violence, um, should that person go and seek a final RFA order, at which point it would be possible for, um, it, it would mean that weapons um, can't be possessed by that individual under federal law. Um, it, it's really just a sort of a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to at least get the weapons out of the way so that the players can then see if there's another tool. And what could happen in the suicide prevention situation, for example, is that the person would stipulate to a final order and in exchange, working with their family who's prob who may be really involved in trying to get them help and trying to partner with them and be their family, <laughs> they might say, you know, will you stipulate to this gun order and then we're not going to push involuntary commitment. And let's help you voluntarily seek treatment in the facility. What I've heard is that a 60-day time frame might not be a long enough period of time in which to do that. Um, and again, um, in the RFA context, if we're comparing this procedure to the RFA, as the judge testified, it's discretionary on the part of the judge how long the order is going to issue. Um, the custom is a year. But I think at the very least, providing for the court to um, exercise its discretion in how long the order needs to issue um, might be a, 
more reasonable option if, if these are really about like let's look case by case and and fit the tools to the scenario you saw that there's provision here that at a certain point after an ex parte order is issued the state might not pursue a final order and maybe that's because either the person is stipulated to a final order or there are other tools available um, okay oh Senator v or representative Vance you had a question about well if this order doesn't make its way into a registry what are we gonna like what do we do I also think that practically speaking part of what happened what can happen and I imagine will happen is that law enforcement or even another interested person maybe that family member can get a copy of this order and bring it around to local local um, gun dealers and say you should know that this order was issued and I I would imagine that that would impact the decision of whether or not to sell maybe not but no. I, ha I do understand that sure, go ahead. No, I, I understand what you're trying to say but uh, you know we heard testimony out on the floor I believe it was last year from representative young his father did exactly that for his brother and his brother knew it he just went far that he you know the, the the circle went bigger he went outside purchased a gun then and committed suicide so yeah so uh, I, I I guess my issue with all this is we're it, it we're, we're creating cracks you know in the system already why I, I and I don't have the answer to this and I'm pretty sure you don't either but there's got to be a way to this is an issue that we have to solve but we have to we have to let everything we have to be talking about everything the mental health issue the registry issue as far as stuff like this should be in the registry until you know well you know the six day day order no but uh, but beyond that when when we get to the point where where we're talking about you know a permanent ban if that's not in you know the, uh, the 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 federal registry we are failing you know our the citizens of the state of vermont as far as i'm concerned sure no i understand um i think the approach that we're all trying to take at this point is um let's grab as much low-hanging fruit as we can in hopes that if, if we can for now we can this is a tool it's a tool that we can use um I think that uh, looking at the registry, I mean, there are a lot of, we have lots of reasons why we'd like to look at the registry and how orders make their way to the registry. Um, I know that um, at the center, re with relief from abuse orders generally, we would like to centralize the mechanism for electronic access, um, and they're looking at tools to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I completely appreciate the comment. Um, I don't have the language today to fix that problem. I wish I did. <laughs> I wish you did. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, the other issue that's come up, there's a question sort of, well, how, do you, how does 221 compare to 422? And what are, why are we talking about these different things? Um, first comment I would make is that the state of Connecticut, which is um, one of the models for 221, has both language that looks like 422 and language that looks like 221 on the books. And I think that that goes to explain why, um, just sort of at the outset, why um, these two items are both different types of tools for different situations and they're complementary. Um, the, but that 221 doesn't fully address the problem posed by 422. So, to go back to last year, and I wasn't even here because of maternity leave, <laughs> but I'm really well versed on it now. Um, in 422, you have we have to start with probable cause that a crime has occurred, and then in that case, domestic, a domestic violence crime, and then um, the law enforcement officer also needs to either obtain a search warrant to get weapons that um, weren't used in the commission of that crime or needs to um, be satisfied that, that one of the warrant exceptions, the constitutional warrant exceptions, can be met. The most common would probably be the exigency exception. Um, consent would also be possible. There's, there are other constitutional exceptions. Law enforcement officers do this all day. It's their job to understand the Fourth Amendment and the Eleventh Amendment to the Constitution um, and the constitutional bases for search and seizure as well as all of the constitutional exceptions. 
Now, once those two things are met, the law enforcement officer, the sort of the threshold, the standard is going to be whether it's reasonably necessary for protection, okay? Let me compare that to 221, just that portion. So in 221, although it's possible that another crime has been committed, and certainly the possible grounds describe things that could in and of themselves be crimes, it's not necessarily required that a separate crime has been committed, or the crime is probably going to be a more minor crime. If we're talking about a very serious violent crime, the better tool is probably going to be to charge that crime and seek a hold without bail. <laughs> and that's what you see in sort of recent cases, that that's sort of the approach. Then, or if the, and or if the person is released on condition, <coughs> it can be a no weapons condition. Um, it's also really important in 221 that we're trying to do this as a civil process because we're trying to address suicide and we shouldn't be criminalizing suicidality. Mental illness. Um, with that in mind, that it's sort of a lower level of activity, the standard is much higher for an ex parte order. It's going to require an extreme risk of imminent danger. So, uh, sort of less uh, serious, not necessarily criminal activity, really high burden to ultimately get us to an order. <coughs> Whereas for the 422, we've established that a crime has occurred. We've established the constitutional warrant exception. And so we just need to show that it's reasonably necessary for the protection of the officer <coughs> or the victim. That's what sort of justifies and makes these two um, balanced, but they're addressing two different situations. And so why would we want the other situation um, to have a lower standard in 422? Well, because maybe what that person did was <coughs> physically strike their partner. There's a context in the history of coercive control and maybe a history of other, what we call low level violence. They haven't gone so far as to break someone's arm or their leg yet. Maybe they've been lucky. And that's why it hasn't happened. But in that immediate situation, maybe they didn't communicate a threat, like I'm going to kill you, or I've got guns, I know how to use them, you know, whatever the sort of threat would be that would get us to a level of extreme risk of imminent danger. We don't require that threat in 422 because we already know statistically in a domestic violence situation where law enforcement has intervened that that's the most dangerous time for a victim. That's nationally, statistically, we know it. So we're not going to require anyone to jump through hoops to show, you know, extreme risk of imminent danger based on threats that a Smart perpetrator probably won't communicate verbally, <laughs> verbally but will have communicated with their conduct. Um, we're not going. We're not going to require that high that high burden. It might not. It, it might not in every case be easy to show, but that doesn't mean that the threat isn't real. And that's why there are 18 states around the country that have bills, or have statutes that look a lot like 422, because it's an acknowledgement that once you have probable cause that a domestic violence crime has occurred, we are in the zone of danger. So, the other main difference between these two bills. <clears throat> in 422, we're not gonna require a court order. And that's because law enforcement has made the sort of determination that they make all day around warrantless search and seizure. Or they could go and get a warrant too, actually, and that would be a court order. It's definitely contemplated in the bill that they could go get a warrant if they wanted to on this basis. And that looks a lot like another issue that would be very familiar in this room, animal cruelty. <laughs> Um, in an animal cruelty case, it's on the, th on the books and I can provide you a citation, if there's um, <coughs> probable cause to believe that the animal on the premises has been neglected, then you, the legislature, have authorized law enforcement in this, and humane society to seize the um, animal for care and protection without a warrant. And that was upheld, that practice was upheld as a matter of constitutional due process in Vermont, both in terms of Fourth Amendment and Article 11, which is the Vermont Corollary Provision, under um, Hegarty v. Addison County Humane Society, and that's 176 Vermont 405, that was decided in 2004, litigated by my former boss, Peter Langrock. <laughs> so, I have to have a little humor. <laughs> um, so, uh, that's, you know, the brief, <coughs> the, 
the very brief version of like the difference between 422 and um, 221 is that um, you're going to require a court order and you're going to have a much higher standard in the extremist protection context because a crime hasn't necessarily occurred. And certainly not a crime that we already know statistically puts the victim in a very direct zone of danger. Um, that would conclude my comments. We're getting really close to time. And yeah, and I do actually, um, so tomorrow I'd like to ask you about the, um, about the burden of proof, whether, you know, the clear and convincing and the... Um, <coughs> oh, yes, absolutely. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Martin, yeah. the, the other question it can again be for tomorrow. I, I've been trying to list the questions you, you've, you've hit on most of them, uh, but uh, the ensuring the surrender and relinquishment of dangerous weapons, if there's any other ideas uh, on, on that particular issue as well. Right. Well, that's another huge difference between 422 and 221. Yeah. yeah. But, but how to deal with it under 221? Sure. I think that's... That's the question, yeah, thanks. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.